shows today about being largely on our thinking about telling Christ how to how to heal us, how to save us, how to deliver us. I've shared with you the story of the scripture of Naaman when he goes and sees the prophet to get healed and he got all upset and mad and because uh, the prophet wouldn't even come out and see him. He sent a servant. Well, that's humiliating if you have a sense of, of entitlement. Now, I don't want to talk to the associate pastor. I want to talk to the pastor. <clears throat> and that's a sense of entitlement. But of course, who'd want to talk to Jeff if you could talk to me? <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to be honest here. So, <laughs> so we go through that. Uh, you know, this whole thing of autocracy and all that. I mean, the world is filled uh, with idolatry even in the body of Christ. And uh, all you need is Jesus Christ. We've all learned that, right? And uh, we don't need no Catholic priests uh, intervening, and uh, we don't have that religion. <clears throat> but anyway, I would wanted to reinforce with Christ <clears throat> His own nature that it, it is undeniable. And God changes not, He cannot lie. And so what happens when you don't recover, you have to realign yourself to where you're missing it. What is it, it, what is it that I'm doing now personally that I might be missing what the Lord has for me? <clears throat> and uh, it's been a real eye-opener for me, especially that, that one rhema out in the backyard, my people tell me how to heal them. It has sent me on a course of theological discovery <clears throat> that has been profound, honestly, to me. I have seen many ways that I have commanded the Lord from His Word. I'm talking about commanding Him from the Word. And I want to say something, this is going to, like I said, uh, I've shared this with my, with uh, the Hester brothers today, they came over, and we spent a few hours together in good fellowship, but I was telling them that uh, it is the nature of Christ to heal. It is His will to heal all, who forgiveth all, who healeth all. Either He does or He doesn't. <clears throat> and the problem lots of times with healing is we have, a, we have a mindset, a paradigm, how we want it done. And it doesn't come that way, and then we, we get frustrated, and we get out from under His authority, out from under His counsel, His will, and then it's kind of like whatever, whatsoever God has promised, uh, I'll take it from there. And that's kind of what happened, and I did that. And now I'm realigning myself. <clears throat> i got to have alignment in my thinking, and I got back into alignment, and it's been a real blessing, to say the least. And I don't know how much I want to get into it, but uh, just to let you know that it is so His will to heal. It, and the, the, the very script of weather is easier to say has just absolutely locked me into a divine mindset. If it's just as easy for Him to say, be forgiven, as it is for Him to be, say, healed, then how come it's such a conflict or a problem? And it, but it seems to be so. People believe He will forgive anybody at any time, but they don't believe He'll heal anybody at any time. And that's not true. He, it's not a matter of healing. It's a matter of Him being true to His nature. You understand? He's, he's a healer. He is Jehovah Rapha. He cannot deny who He is. And through all my 53 years of serving Him, I've seen miracles and signs and wonders in my own body of numerous healings. And then I've seen times when He has instructed me a different direction for healing. I've also seen Him instruct me with counsel of wisdom to stop taking what I was taking, which I didn't know I was taking. And uh, I'm not talking about meds, I'm talking about eating something or drinking something. And believe it or not, uh, uh, the best thing I think I've ever done in my life when I got off the poison of Pepsis and Cokes and drinks. I mean, thank you, Jesus. I mean, my whole my life changed dramatically what I was drinking and putting into my body until He spoke to me. And it, and it came from a word of wisdom <clears throat> that I had about another individual. A young lady that used to fellowship. I went to, came here for a long time. And she had migraines every day of her life, and she was only in her early, early 20s. And one day the Lord spoke to me and told me He was going to heal her. Now listen to this unique healing. And I said, well, then I'll go up there and lay hands on her. See, here you, here you. Didn't, even, didn't even think otherwise. <clears throat> Got halted by the Lord. And He said, no. 
Her headaches are caused by massive, the migraines are caused by massive amount of caffeine. And tell her to get off this caffeine. Her body can't take it. That's the word I got. I went up there and I talked to her and I said, Sis, uh, can you tell me what you drink during the day? This sounds crazy to me, but she'd almost take, she'd almost down a case of Coke every day. We're talking about 15, 18 cans of Coke every day. Well, I don't know if you know it, they are masked out with sugar and caffeine. I'm not into this type of stuff. It's not my theology, by the way. And I'm just telling you a moment that I had with him that uh, revolutionized my thinking. And uh, my daddy was sick with migraines that made him terribly sick. And he'd go into a dark room. He couldn't take noise or even people talking. And I was there one night, one day, and, and after I had this experience, I said, Daddy, you know, you drink about 10, 15 cups of coffee every single day for years and years and years. Every time I see you, you've got a cup of coffee in your hand. I said, would it be worth to you to get rid of that, all that caffeine? Now look, moderation, okay? I'm not casting anything out. You were talking about extreme lifestyles. Your body can't take. Uh, there was a guy who died recently on the news uh, because he drank too much water. It killed him. Water. Really? Yeah, he died with drinking too much water. And uh, he got to drink it and couldn't get, didn't want to get off of it and kept drinking it and started, started believing that you have to have eight glasses a day, then you had to have 12, then you had to have 16 ounces. And it went on and on and on to where it, your body can't take it. And uh, they actually, uh, he, actually got, he actually died drinking too much water. His body revolted. And uh, he started puking it all up and throwing it up, and that wasn't enough. And then he went into convulsions and he died. And it was all based upon extreme and excess. That's why the scripture talks about moderation. So anyway, I told my dad the same thing. I said, Dad, would you, be, would you like to get rid of those migraines? Man, I've asked the Lord, and I've prayed, and I've asked Jesus. Well, I know you have. I said, would you like to get rid of those migraines? I said, yes. I said, could you receive a word of knowledge? And that's all you would need. But now you know, he was assembly of God, so you only do two or three things. Right? You lay, have lay, hands laid on you, and they anoint you with oil, and if that don't work, then Jesus doesn't want to heal you, and you're one of the outcasts that he doesn't really care for, because <clears throat> so, he's prejudiced and partial. And that is that theology. <clears throat> well, he's not. So I said to my dad, Dad, if you stop drinking caffeine, uh, you'll, you won't have any more headaches. He couldn't hardly believe that. Well, he loved coffee. He was, uh, to me, he was addicted to it. And uh, he said, you actually believe that? I, said, no, I absolutely know that. I've learned and found out that extreme amount of sugar, extreme amount of salt, extreme, uh, extreme, right? Caffeine, whatever, it, your body can't take it. The uh, first thing they told me, which I didn't know this, is that with, Paul, is that you? Send them angels in, man. We need some healing wings tonight. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> But uh, tell me, you know, in high blood pressure, the first thing they say is, don't get on salt. Well, what they don't tell you is sugar is worse than salt for high blood pressure. But it's a natural thing for everybody to say, oh, man, don't, drink, don't get on that salt. Don't take that salt. Well, all this you find out affects your body and, and uh, how extreme and excessive. Now, I don't mind telling you, I'm pretty extreme on that salt because I'm a popcorn-eating man. And I don't, want the, I don't want the stuff to taste like cardboard. So, <laughs> I mean, put the junk on it. The, the lard and the butter and the salt. Yes, put it on there. Can't, can't figure out what's wrong with me. <laughs> so, anyway, my daddy got off of it. He never had another headache. He could not believe it. Now, he went through withdrawals. He actually did. I never would have thought you would with caffeine, but, man, he got to where he was miserable. Uh, without it, but he stayed off of it and never had another migraine. And he was absolutely thankful to the day he died, and he was shocked that it actually happened. And so, didn't have to have no angel come down, you know, and 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 you know, put it put a coal on his lip, you know. <laughs> yeah, all he had to do is quit drinking that stuff in excess, even extreme. But I want to say this: we're probably going to go through a lot of revelation on healing in the next few months here. Because we're in a season where Satan is taking advantage of our ignorance. 
and we're about to be educated. If you can go with this next level of Christ coming with the education that He wants to bring to us, then what we will do is we will learn things and know things that we've never known before, and it's going to change our lives dramatically. And uh, all we have to do, and I've learned this one from a different perspective, and I don't want to bring out any much details here, but I would just like to simply say, one of the ones that I learned is the most dangerous. And you're a dead man, you're a dead woman when you do it. And that's when you come out under the authority of what Christ has told you to do. If you think you can come out from under authority and get by with something for a long period of time, you've deceived yourself. That coming out from authority makes you naked and open to satanic forces that there's no one that can stop it on the earth because you're not in submission to anybody, not even Christ. And so same it is with women, with, with wives, when they come out from under their husbands. They're vulnerable. I tell you, Satan will take advantage of it. I have seen it. I've experienced it personally. <clears throat> and uh, maybe I will say this. Three o'clock in the morning, I walked into my kitchen and I said to Gloria Lee, she said, what are you doing? I said, I've just come to say goodbye. And she just could not handle that. What? I said, I've just come to say goodbye. I understood enough about God that you're not going to recover. And I told her right to her face why she wasn't going to recover. And then she went for her t traditional religious perspective and went to Tulsa to get a man of God to pray for her and he never even laid hands on her. Had a couple of sisters that took her to help her out. And even before she went, I told her again, don't go. Well, he's going to lay hands on me. No, he'll never lay hands on you. And he didn't lay hands on her. And the, it's not a condemnation. I surely don't indict or judge. You understand? I'm just, what I've learned. What I've learned. When I come out from under the authority of Christ, I'm going to prolong my healing, my recovery. Mine's been prolonged, so I had to rethink some things. And when it's prolonged and you're praying, you're seeking God, you're not getting results. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not God. You can't start this theology, well, the Lord, you know, He doesn't heal everybody. You don't need all this why you didn't get it. You need to know why you didn't get it. <laughs> you follow me? And so I've done some real soul searching in the last 48 hours. My wife has been very honest with me, helped me tremendously. The Hester boys came over today and helped me. I actually received a text today from Pam Ashcraft, which was dynamic. And they're seeing where this has come, has happened, and how I could realign my thinking. My, my thinking got off, and uh, didn't know it. I saw it clearly once we started talking about it. I mean, it was just as clear as day. And that's when you in, take up your own life, and you can you can do it, you can take it from there. When I came out of surgery, I thought I was finished. I did what Jesus told me to do. This is what He wanted me to do. I got it now. I'm going to recover. And I didn't stay under recovery. And then I found out there are three stages of that of obedience to Christ when He directed me the way I, I'm to go. That was the first stage. You need. You have a problem. You've had a heart attack. There's nothing you can do about that. It's already happened. The second stage is what are you going to do about it? What's God's will? I went before Him and He chose a sovereign direction for me. I believe in sovereign reign and providential rule with all my heart. And I'm going to say that by saying this. Luke said, had they recorded all that Jesus Christ has done, there's not enough books in the world to, to, to store it. Now I said that to say something that's going to be maybe offensive. Christ is much more than this Bible. There is no scripture in this Bible that tells me thou shalt have an open heart surgery. Thou shalt have triple bypass surgery. There's nothing there. God is sovereign and providential by nature. And He's got enough word here for us to understand Him. But there's more to God than the Bible. But I'm careful not to get out in that realm. <laughs> You know, I remember Kenneth Hagin said, well, if you, you know, I've got something that they, that old boy told him, I've learned something that's not in the Bible. And Kenneth Hagin said, well, you've learned a little bit more than I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm kind of like that too. I know he is in sovereign reign and providential rule, but there is a scripture somewhere 
that will let you know, even if you use the broad term, His will, that He will reveal His will. Uh, uh, he showed his, uh, his ways unto Moses, His acts unto the children of Israel. That's an entirely difference. I'll show you my way, Randy, but I'll show the body of Christ my acts, because they don't really know my way. Well, you and I want to be disciples where we don't just see the acts, we want to know His, his ways, right? So, I get on my knees and I sought the Lord on this. And I felt I needed to say this tonight, uh, because even with the two Hester boys, they brought this out last night. They were kind of troubled by some things. <clears throat> and I saw what they saw, and I didn't see it from that perspective. And they're actually right. And I want to make something clear. Not everybody's mean. And you can't go. When I was, live, when I was in California, <clears throat> and divine healing came through Herbie Zell, the fellowship there, and the body of Christ. And at that time, to be honest with you, I hate to use this term because they're not healers, but the term was there. There was a lot of healers at that time. They had a lot of ministers, both men and women, have a lot of signs, wonders, and miracles with healing. I was early 20 years of age. And then the next thing you know, people literally in a meeting would take their glasses off or their hearing aid and stomp them and proclaim they're healed. Now, we learned you can't get more foolish than that. Did, and, his, and I didn't know that because I thought, well, that's what you, you know, you're by faith, you're trusting God. And Herbie Zell said, tell me, one person in here, by throwing your glasses away, that throwing your glasses away heals you. Because they started, their faith was in their act, not in God. It wasn't toward God, it was in toward the deed. And then nobody going to get healed by stomping your, your hearing aid. You, fo you follow me? That doesn't heal you. Well, that got into that. Same thing <clears throat> on pills, meds, and doctors. And uh, I thought I'd back uh, up on a little bit of this with y'all from my own perspective. I, I won't change that much from what I said last night, but I want to put it out on a different perspective. And that is we don't all have the same constitution. And we don't all have the same physical problem or the physical battle that we're fighting. And, and also, what works for you won't work for me. This is all about God and revealing to you where you're at and what He can do in your life with wisdom and counsel. So ain't nobody going home and start flushing the meds down the toilets. And uh, if they're good ones, give them to me. <laughs> but, but the issue is that, now let me tell you what uh, I learned this from Matt today. Didn't know this. He said, meds, are, there are two different kinds. There are those that will destroy you, and then there are those who will help you get to where you need to go. He said, let me give you an example. You have an inflammation. Christ has brought you and, and ordained you to go a certain way this time that you're not familiar with. Usually that faith, I'm healed, thank you Jesus, my stripes, I'm healed, all that. I, I, and I still believe that. Still, That's biblical. Won't back off of that. Then you go through, then how would you like to do this? Well, then he reveals that to you. And, and I've had a number of people I've laid hands on. I've had different words for every one of them that come up for a different type of healing. So this is not new to me, except when it went this way, it was new to me. <clears throat> but what happened, he said, inflammation is, first of all, he said, doctors know this. They can't heal. Your body supernaturally, miraculously heals itself. They know that. They, some of them don't know how it does it, but they know that your body will heal itself. What the med is supposed to do is not keep you on it all your life, is to get the inflammation out so the body can start healing. I said, and I know that. I know your body can't heal under inflammation. I don't care what it is. So if you're just religious, you're going to go one way. And I've, been, and I've done that most of my life, by the way. If and that is religiously, I got into, now this, I don't mean this in any disrespect to the movement that I'm about to speak of. I still hold on to the major part of the teaching of the Word of Faith. Faith and confession is a still a part of my personal life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Oh, no, I don't need to get into it. Anyway, nonetheless, it's still there. It's, it's showbread for me. And, but here's what I found out. In the arrogance of your religion and getting one scripture and confessing one thing and then expecting God to perform it, you can see what we're talking about. You can't get God on a scripture and demand Him to perform it. Do you see that? And that's really what a lot of Word of Faith does. It grabs a scripture, surely He hath. At that point you've got no other alternative. He either has or He hasn't. Well He has, but will He now bring that out in your life? 
If you're not instantly healed by that. So here you've got to go theologically and say, are we healed or are we going to be healed? The answer is yes. And once you can realize that, things change in your paradigms. Yes, I am Jehovah Rapha, but I may not be that to you, but I exist to become that. Are you following me? So I say, Isaiah 53, surely he hath borne my griefs and carried my sorrow. And I want to say something here. (coughs) Sorry. (coughs) Can you turn that up when I do that? (laughs) So what, what, on the word, surely he hath borne our griefs, the word griefs is only translated about five or six times. Every single time from Genesis all the way to Malachi, it's sickness and disease. Translated sickness and disease dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Surely he hath borne our griefs. He's a man acquainted with our griefs. Think about that term. He was acquainted with sickness and disease. He was acquainted to it. He was introduced to it in his body. So now he was acquainted with our griefs. He bore our griefs because he, when he got introduced to sickness and disease, he took it. He was acquainted. He bore it. You can say grief because here's the reason the King James uses grief. I ran this all out. Because sickness and disease is grievous. It is so grievous. You can say uh, man, how you doing? You, you, uh, you're grieving? Yeah, I've been grieving for about four months. You can say that, but that's King James, but you can still translate that right down to English today. And if anybody in here that has pain, that's feeling bad, I mean, it's grievous. There's nothing, you're not celebrating and, and drinking vodka. You know, you're not celebrating a big party and, and having a Bud Light party at your home. You better not anyway. It makes a homosexual out of you. So don't be drinking that stuff. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> Boy, bless their hearts. They ain't never going to recover from that one. I don't care. Seriously, I don't care how much money they pour into it. It got, it got that, it hit the wrong way with them old boys. They forgot who they were selling it to. And these old, these old boys that redneck buying, driving pickup trucks with rifles in the window with boots and cowboy shirts on. <laughs> 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 they ain't going to pick up another one. Well, anyway, let the world do what the world does. Amen? Go back to Jeff's teaching a few weeks ago. We have nothing to do with this cosmos. <clears throat> Thank God we don't. <clears throat> I just want to throw a little something out there, a little pragmatic for you, let you know that I, I, my theology, and I'm going to use it that term, is both it ha- he has and he will. That's just, what, that's just life. I was saved 2,000 years ago. But I wasn't saved until March of 1970 in Downing. You follow me? You've just got to accept this theology. It's a reality. And if you leave out one of them, then you have no possibility of any recovery. When you say, he said, you shall recover, that is a future tense statement. He didn't say if you'll recover instantly or within a week or within a month. You look at a lot of them that he healed in the New Testament, and some of them returned back later healed. Some of them was healed instantly, and some of them got healed while they were walking away. So I've seen all that myself. I've seen all that, all that through the, my, my uh, 30s and 40s. Uh, man, did I see, I just saw people, it's just amazing. I remember one of, of the big meetings where there's this... <clears throat> uh, what was his name? He, was a, he had a gifts of healing out there. More Cirilla, sorry. I was under him for a long time. I learned a lot from him. I was in one of his meetings. And uh, a, a healing started happening. Kind of a corporate presence started hitting. And these people gathered around this individual on in a wheelchair, and it was grievous. I'm just a babe in Christ, but it's grievous what they're trying to do. And uh, they're trying to, of course, now I look back, they were trying to do whatever they could do to get, get him healed. I don't know how, why I got involved, <laughs> but I did. I sat in my chest, no, nah, I'm not going to sit here and watch this. So I got up and I just walked over to him. I said, sir, give me a hand and get up in Jesus' name. He gave me a hand and walked right out of that wheelchair. 
Well, that's what I'd already had seen and believed all my life. In other words, all this other stuff talking you into it and trying to win you over, it just doesn't work. Just in Jesus' name, arise and walk. Well, that became all, all these instant miracles that I was permitted to see by the Lord with my own hands. Then, and I'm not talking about me having it, I'm talking about Him through me. That it set my uh, instant miraculous lifestyle for healing. Everything would be you get before God, wham, maybe a couple of days you're going to step out of your body, you'll have to do with demons, demons, but you're going to get it. Well, all that was there. And uh, on this one, and none of that was there. And when he said, oh, my people tell me how to heal them, uh, I'm with, I got to tell you all this, this is funny. It's not that I'm narcissistic. Uh, I'll make that clear before I say this. But when he said, my people tell me how to heal them, I thought, what's wrong with them? <laughs> I swear to God, I did. I did. What's wrong with them? Well, Jesus, I'll address this house. And that's about as far as I got before I got spanked. And I stopped, oh, he gave me a little scripture. Prophets are always first partakers. Oh, man, I cannot tell you how that humbled me in the backyard. And I started saying, oh boy, I'm going to get a spanking. I know I'm going to get a spanking right now. Okay, Jesus, tell me how I tell you how to heal me. Yeah. And I be, Now, it's been a process. I've learned dozens of different things in, in that length of time. I learned more today. If He chooses a certain way for you, there are three stages I was telling you about that I didn't finish. <clears throat> there is the pre, there's the mid, and then there's the post. Now, here's where I made my disconnect and came out from under the way He chose for me. Remember the way He chose. I had to accept, and I cannot tell you how difficult this has been for me. I had to accept that it was God's will for me to go and have open heart surgery. I have experienced far too many miracles to even think that's to be considered. And I go to God and I go to prayer and I just as clear as day I get this old biblical blessed assurance. This is what I want you to do. And I start crying, this is your will. This is the way I want you to go. I'm taking you this way. This will be my kindness to you. I will go to work for you. Now look, I want to tell you what's interesting. <clears throat> when he gave me that term again, kindness, I triggered back into the teaching I did. It means to be employed. It means to be employed by you. In, because kindness demonstrates a deed. Kindness is about His nature, but in kindness, if I'm going to say, Crystal, I'm going to be kind to you, does that not mean I'm going to do something? Or just be kind? See, it's not me just being kind, I'm going to demonstrate. Well, the word kindness, you look at it in the Greek, it says to be employed. And I started crying, I said, Jesus, you're going to go to work for me? You're going to send me this way? And I know in my heart, I have the assurance I'm to do this. But now I know that you're going to go to work for me. I said, that's humbling. I get to the, I get there the first day that his name is Dr. Chastain. I called him Dr. Chest Pain. <laughs> I did. I called him. I said, Dr. Chest Pain, because you know, he's the one who opens you up. And he said, I've been called that. That's what he said. I've been called that before. But I said, uh, he said, uh, I understand you're a minister. Said, yes, sir, I am. How long have you known the Lord? I want you to listen to this. I said, how long have you known the Lord? I said, 53 years. <clears throat> well, I want you to know, sir, you went to work for him for 53 years. He's about to go to work for you. That's the Greek word kindness. I, I choked up. He didn't know. He had no idea he's prophesying. Had no idea. It was prophetic by spirit. I just sat and looked at him and choked up. I, I got that frog in my throat. Oh, Jesus, I just heard that. I just heard that. I relaxed. I gave myself to the way of God. See, not just to the will. This time was about the way. I gave myself to the way of God, but I forgot the, the post. And that means I thought I'd go in, they'd operate on me, I'd come out, and they'd send me home, and I had done what Jesus told me to do. I had no idea the battle becomes in recovery. And here's Matt's words to me, Randy, you had a heart attack, bam, it hit you. You had nothing to do with it. Next thing you know, your wife has you in the hospital. They got you sedated. You wake up, it's already done. You haven't done anything yet. Now you're about to do something. You come out from under him now, 
and start telling him what meds you're going to take, what meds you're not going to do, and then what you're going, how you're going to do this, and how you're going to do that, you've taken your life back. It's going to be a long journey for you. And I believe you've done that. That's what they came and told me today. I've asked them not to come to church anymore, but they're here. <laughs> they're here anyway. They came anyway. <laughs> and uh, I told them today that, well, you know, Shelly, I, I have to tell you by listening to you guys, I said, uh, Shelly told me I was one of the most stubborn men he's ever met. How many of you know Shelly doesn't always hit it? How many of you know? He's just a man. So, but he told me, you're one of the most stubborn. And I, I found myself stubborn. And what happened in, in the third trimester of the recovery, it was true. That is when you have to come under and obey. You're about to be told how to come out of this, either supernaturally, divine visitation, healing on angels' wings, laying on a hands, a prophet comes over. Are you with me? Whatever it is, you now you have to have this assurance you're in the will of God. Well, I had that, but I came out from under the way. And uh, then what happened? I saw it. Now I went to the Lord today and repented. After they left, I got up, went, and got before the Lord and repented. I repented for letting them in the house. So, <laughs> so I repented to the Lord and said, Jesus, I didn't know it. I, I came out from under. I, I came out, <clears throat> they're saying, here's what, see, here's what they told me. This is interesting. They told me that, you know, what is it that you do? You need to do no, nothing else that's got stress right now. We're about your life. This is about your life. You need to recover. And I said, well, I'm a minister. Then you need to stop that for a while. You need to stop this for a while. You don't need to go be around people. Don't get around groups of people because you're vulnerable. Your uh, uh, immune system is, is and you, and well, then I take off the Branson and got so sick. I, I thought, literally, I, I tell you the truth, I thought I was going to die twice in Branson. I really did. I couldn't. I didn't think I was going to make it. Didn't think I was going to get through the night. So everything they've told me to do, I didn't. I think that's wisdom. That's what you do. You go to the pros and ignore them. That's the primary thing you want to do. So there are other ways. I understand that. And the Lord could have told me another way. I just want to say to this house so you understand, it is His will to heal me. It is His will for me to recover 100%. I will tell you in the presence of my Lord Jesus Christ, you'll see me sit here one night fully recovered. Back to my energy, my strength, my health, Everything will be there because it's His nature. All I have to do is obey the way He's chosen for me. <clears throat> so what I did, <clears throat> I started <clears throat> telling them, I'm not taking that. I'll, and then they said, this is what you'll take. So I go home and I get a peel cutter and I cut it in half, <laughs> take half of it. And <laughs> I'm doing all this. And bless my wife, stressed out. I mean, it's so stressed my wife out watching me and working with me and trying to work with me, I should say. It's not exact. No, Gloria was right. I'm a very deep and complex man. And I believe Shelley should meditate that because that word stubborn, that it's deep and complex, Shelley. Say it with me. Deep <laughs> and complex. <laughs> huh? Sounds better. Sounds better than stubborn. I, I prefer that. Boy, Randy, you're a very complex man. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're such a deep thinker. You miss God constantly. Thank you. I appreciate that. What was it? You probably took it as a compliment. <laughs> Crystal said, I probably took that as a compliment when Gloria said that to me. Well, actually, I did. <laughs> I did. I, I've always thought I was shallow. I had, I had a moment of being deep. I mean, you know. So, <laughs> so I, didn't, I didn't want to kick this out here tonight. That's not what this is about. But I also felt uh, as a brother, I wouldn't have done this. I'd have corrected myself and repented to God. But as an elder, I felt obligated. I felt I need to share with this house a little bit more of, of this than I have been. So you'll understand the journey that I went on and the way that I think and the way that I process things. I'm not an emotional processor. Crystal emotionally processes things. And uh, being deep and as I am, I, I rationalized. And I, I did make a disconnect. I actually thought I did what he told me to do because I went and got the operation. You follow me? Now I'm going to go out and I'm going to start getting in shape and I'm going to get back to the gym and I'm going to get my life back and I'm going to recover. Well, my body was so damaged, which I didn't know. I mean, and the doctor finally said, uh, said Mr. Shankle, uh, you have totally and deeply underestimated this operation. 
And he said, this is a serious operation that people die from. And you need to slow down and let your body start healing. You've got a lot of healing to do. And see, I'm thinking restoration. I'm not thinking healing. I'm not thinking process of healing. I'm just thinking, I'll restore. I'm going to get out here. And I'm doing all this walking five miles a day, which is still a good idea. I mean, get out and get busy. I mean, get, you know, get your body. Don't just lay there and dry up. But I put a lot of pressure on my body before it was ready to hit that, that level. And uh, I was up in Branson. And I, well, I'm, you know, I've done 30 minutes for, for two days in a row. I'm going to kick it up to 45 today. And now I'm, and I, now I'm coughing and all that. I, so the, the next session, you know something? I can do an hour. I'm going to walk a, a, an athletic pace for an hour. The next day, Chris and I started going for a walk. <laughs> I get about 100 foot, man. I'm over underneath the shade tree, man, over. I said, Crystal, I don't know how we're going to get back. <laughs> so, so I haven't been exactly kind to myself, <clears throat> to say the least. <clears throat> you know, patience is not a virtue that I spend a lot of time with. So, <clears throat> all right, so I just want to kind of update you guys a little bit, let you know where I'm at. And, uh, I don't know. I, I think when this is the next two nights, tonight, tomorrow night, so maybe I'll meet with somebody else. We'll sit down and talk about maybe a different plan or strategy. Uh, I've just got to tell you something right off the cuff. Uh, I'm, I'm going to need uh, some time to recover. I, uh, I'm just going to have to have some time. Whew. There is somebody else that is going to need to know what you are going through and will need some wisdom from that. This is not about you. This is about him and what he needs to bring to somebody else. Because if you remember when you were in the hospital getting your surgery, <coughs> the people that were healed, and yeah. Crystal even told people, well, while he's here, you're not gonna die. It is about him working through you for his purpose. It's well, about I put him you on a road to recovery, says God, and I look to this body, and I will let them know that I'm still the one that's healing, but I'm putting you back on my path, says the Lord. Amen. A road to my recovery, a road to my entire and complete salvation. I believe that, and I believe this is the road or a journey that I need to learn. I'm going to say this <clears throat> based upon what Lisa also said. I agree for millions of my brothers and sisters who have dogmas that are not flexible with God. It's always one way every time. Same thing every time over and over. It doesn't happen. People don't get it. And they think they didn't obey them or didn't do what, you know, that's, here we go with that. There has always been, listen, I have known through the years growing up, I've seen it personally. <laughs> It's usually more in, in the southern Bible state, Bible Belt states of the Pentecostal movement where thousands of children die because they won't take them to a doctor or give them a Tylenol. They don't believe in it. There are millions of Christians that don't believe in doctors and medicine. What they don't realize is why, what it is there for. You know, uh, Matt said something today. And uh, I knew it was true because I've already studied it. When Christ said woe unto doctors, He's talking about the doctors of the law. Doctors of the law and lawyers. Woe unto them. Well now we know that doctors have no desire, m most of them. Forget the fact that it's, it's high price. I think, uh, I don't know what my bill is right now. It was $330,000 a month ago. Uh, so you know how that, how that worked. I, I just paid it off with cash. I didn't pay no mind to that. But yeah, and now now we've gone back a number of other times. So I don't know what it is now. But the, the bottom line is, it yes, it is expensive. But when you go to medical doctors, not legal doctors, these medical doctors are trying to help you. These guys are not programmed to bring death, killing, and hurt. I mean, this is a different. When you talk about doctors and lawyers, you're talking about a you're talking about an, a judicial system that does not mind letting the wicked and the, the rapists and, and the killers and the muggers off. That's what they do all the time. All the time. So woe unto that whole judicial system that's ruled by these, that they called them doctors at that time, see? And it wasn't just doctors of the medical, this was judicial, they called them. Well, that's where he's at. 
And I've seen Pentecostal. I've seen uh, Assembly of God. I've watched, I've watched holiness churches uh, refuse to help their children. Uh, and they can't figure out why when the law comes in and takes the child, they can't figure that out. Well, it, it is a, it's a certain sense of abuse because it, you can't even see the reality of this other world. So I would take you to a real common ground. Do you drink water? I suggest that you stop. You don't need water, you need Jesus. You don't need to eat. You don't need to drink. You don't need to sleep. You don't even need to take baths or wash your hair. Jesus keep you clean. This went on. This went on in California, believe it or not. This very thing I'm telling you went on in California. And so the, this whole issue, and I've been caught up in this all my life. Now mine was, I've never been opposed to doctors or medicine. I have not, I've never had. What I saw was the miracles. So I'd rather have a microwave moment than an oven moment. You, you see, what, I, that's all it was. It hadn't to do with one, one not of God, one demonic, one's of God. I just, I love the miracles. I mean, I'd, I'd like to step off this platform tonight, and before I get off the platform, boom! You know what I mean? I mean, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? The, rather than go through all of this process. The whole thing with me is not doctors and medicine, it's process. Four months. When you could indict God and said it, would, it could have been four seconds. When he said, <laughs> this is my assurance, I thought I was healed. But I t- <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> But it's my assurance that this is, the way, this is the way I'm leading. Now, I've had to learn the way of healing. Right now, I have 34 different teachings on different ways that God heals biblically. Can you believe that? 34 of them. And they're all one hour long, at least. And I've done about 12 or 15 of them already on the podcast. I've just been doing them in succession. Since this, my people tell me how to heal them. I thought I may as well find out all the scriptures I can on healing and see all the ways of recovery. And some is right now, some is uh, uh, present, some is future. You shall recover. And I say, we shall recover. So, all that being said, kind of updates. I hope it's a little bit better for you. I see people making the terrible mistakes, stomping the glasses, flushing. In California they flush their meds. And some people like to die. People with high blood pressure that hasn't really got that under control, you better be careful what you do. You're about to have an aneurysm or a heart attack. So all this has got to do with a lot of pragmatic wisdom behind it that we haven't really applied a lot to. Now let me say it by finish it by saying this. I am not sure how many times I've operated from the spirit of an antichrist. The spirit of an antichrist denies Jesus came as a human. The spirit of antichrist denies humanity. Spirit of antichrist denies human logic and reasoning. The spirit of antichrist denies common sense. Is he loose in America, in the colleges? The spirit of antichrist is all in our colleges right now. They're stupid. They're absolutely just stupid people. Kids that's got some type of mental illness, it's highly contagious, and it's sweeping the colleges. It's just a mental illness. It's nothing more than that. Because they deny human common sense. If someone asked me the question, what is a woman? I wouldn't even answer the stupid question. You follow what I'm saying? That's a retarded question. It doesn't demand an answer. No more than what is a man. If you have already have to ask the question, what is a woman or what is a man, you're already sick. I mean, since when did, we, did, since when did this change in the last 15,000 years? <laughs> So you follow me? So in other words, I said, I would not answer that question. Anybody ask, Randy, do you know what a woman is? I'd, I'd just backslap and ask Jesus, forgive me. I'd go Catholic for a moment. Father, forgive me for what I'm about to do. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I wouldn't pay no mind that foolishness. But it, the whole thing so is that I've had to understand humanity, God, God doesn't, but Christians deny humanity. They can't take the human sitting down. No, it's be spiritual. It's all about spiritual. And I've seen the spiritual. I'm 100% for it. 
But I believe that Crystal and I, we're not spirit beings, we're husband and wife. This is two flesh people, right here, two humans. We've got to work out our, our human things uh, the way we're supposed to work them out, humanly. We want to use the Word of God in Christ in our marriage, but, uh, but I don't see any reason. <laughs> I don't see any reason for us to, to deny our humanity. We love each other in the flesh. We love each other in the soul. We love each other in the mind. I love her mind. I love her will, her emotions. I love the way she thinks. I love the way she rationalizes. It's, re it's a joy for me to see her differ with me 24-7. Uh -huh. so <laughs> no, it is a joy to see the fact where we agree and where we disagree. And I, I, I've said this to Crystal in a marriage, I've, I have had disagreements with Crystal, but I'll make something clear. I disagree with myself. Disagreeing is not a problem. I do. I disagree with myself a lot of times. You can't believe how the arguments I will have with my, the two boys once they get into that argument. I don't have any problem with disagreeing with uh, George, and George doesn't have any problem with uh, disagreeing with me. And it's not a problem. He promises to beat me up physically. I promise to call down fire. We shut this thing down as quick as we can. So, <laughs> all right. Are we comfortable right now? Have I provoked any questions that you'd like to ask? Shelly, good to see you. Really good to see you, bud. Always is. I'm glad you're doing good. You are, aren't you? You're not stubborn, are you? No, oh, I didn't think so. Huh? Good to see Bobby. Bobby yes. Bobby yeah. Bobby in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't, have, you don't have to say nothing, Bobby. You and me, we, if we didn't come from the same peas in the pot, I'd kiss your foot. Me, you, and Matt Hester. God help all three of us. You talk about grace to get us to heaven. We're the ones who believe in grace. How you doing, though, Bobby? Recovering? Recovering yeah. because he is stubborn, but you know, last night he wasn't here because he was in a ton of pain. Oh yeah. And yeah. You know, it's it's a process. Now see, it is, and we're going to go through this process and learn something we've never known before. And would God choose a pragmatic way of doing something? Yes, I shared the story before with y'all on the blind men. How many people Christ healed that were blind? This one guy comes up to him, he picks up a handful of dirt, spits in it, makes mud, slaps it in his eyes, goes, tells him to wash in a pool. That guy could have stopped, excuse me, what's wrong with just saying, eyes be open? Why don't you just let me touch the cloak or your hem of your garment? You follow me? You could have done it, you could have said it a thousand different ways. But all he had to do was go wash in the pool, get the mud out of his eyes says he came back seeing. So now I have asked myself this, and this would be good for all of us. Do I want to be healed? Or do I want, do I want to control the way I'm recovering? Where's my real need? Do I want to see? Or do I want to curse the mud? Follow me? So I look at my life. Say, no, I want to come back seeing. So, go. you know, the guy said... Uh, I'm not going to go dunk myself seven times in a muddy river. Well, then remain a leper the rest of your life. You follow me? Christ could have healed him from the servant. You follow me what I'm saying? The servant could have went out and called down the power of God. The prophet sitting in the house said, go tell him to dunk himself seven times in Jordan. I'm thinking, that's retarded. Who wants to do that? But you ask yourself, do you want good skin? Or you want to be right the rest of your life and be a leper and keep your pride. Well, I'm not interested in my pride. I'm not interested in my stubbornness if I see it when I can. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm just interested in the will of God for our lives. And I believe Christ is going to bring a wonderful healing and, and a miraculous healing through this house to bring a lot of people back to health and healing and strength, but, from a, but we're going to have to change our paradigms. Now, I'm going to tell you something right here, some pragmatically. <clears throat> I've been told by the Lord, I to listen to this closely, I was told by the Lord to tell some people that were seriously overweight that if they did not lose that weight, it's going to cost them their life. I've told that people here in this house that have not done it. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a practical thing. This doctor tells me, here's what he tells me. 
Mr. Shankle, this high blood pressure has kind of got us all a little bit confused. There's three different doctors working on me. And I said, and what's the deal? He said, well, look at you. He said, you look great. You work out, you stay healthy, you eat the right things, you, you take care of yourself. He said, if we could say, Mr. Shankle, you need to lose 50, 60 pounds, then your blood pressure will get back down to normal, and you won't, you won't be, uh, what's that that you get also, that uh, diabetic, you know, you get rid of di diabetes, your blood pressure go down. All you got to do is lose 50, 60 pounds. And he said, but we can't tell you that. And he laughed, I wish we could, because that would give them the answer why so now they're looking at, oh, you follow me. Look, we all know this. We all know Crisco does it to you. We all know 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 pounds overweight is going to damage you. When my girls started off in soccer, and I, I'm not, this is the part of healing. This is a part of healing right here. This is where you can't deny humanity. Humanity cannot do it and put that pressure on that body all those years, you will get by with it, your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. When you hit 60 and 70, you're going to pay for it royally. Pay for it royally. So <clears throat> I'm at, uh, give you an example, I'm at Buffalo River with a bunch of guys. And uh, Reese will remember this. <clears throat> and uh, one of the guys, wants to, he wants to dive off a high cliff. And uh, I'm sitting down there, and I said to him, don't do that. I'm telling you, don't do that. Oh, I can do that, ego. I said, yeah, but you don't have to. You follow me? We're not in high school anymore. We don't have to. We can. I can do flips off of it. I can do back flips off of it. Now, they're going to take me to the hospital, but I can do it. <laughs> so <laughs> they're going to have the reason Paul's going to have to come out and fish me out, but I can still do it. Well, I told him about five times, don't do it. Then I finally said, this is not about you. There's 12, 15 guys here. It's going to shut down. The, you can shut down the whole system. Oh, I can do this. Dove off and split his head wide open on a boulder. And Reese and a few other guys got together, rushed him down to the hospital in Little Rock. Well, you see where I'm coming from. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You've got to find out the way of the Lord. And now all he had to done was climb back down. You follow me? So all this has, there's a lot of stuff here. So I'm, I am realizing that you can't, you can't take in Crisco lard all your life. Right. You can't be deep fried double wide all your life. If you're deep fried, you're going to be double wide. And that just goes with the turf. We're talking common sense here, are we not? Yes, just common sense. You drink a lot of liquor and alcohol, you're going to destroy your liver. Common sense. All that is just, so this is all about humanity here, for us being wise. And if you don't think that Jesus Christ has common sense, then you don't think He came in the flesh. He had all the common, God even said, let us come together and what? Let's reason together. Let's talk about this a little bit. And I, I've just wanted to make some changes in my life. I don't want to, I want to give myself to the will of God. I've told Chris, it's not just living a long life. I want to live a healthy life. So therefore, I want to keep myself in the, you know, i got to say this. I, it's really funny. Since I went through all this, I put on about 10 pounds. <clears throat> and I'm there talking to the doctor. He comes in and says, man, Randy, you're looking great. And I, I look, at this, looking great. And I'm thinking, I put on 10 pounds. Well, I was telling the history about this, and they kind of laughed today too. We all did. But he, he sat and looked at me in the same thing, thinking, I said, I'm 73 years of age, and I'm worried about 10 pounds? Are you following me? I mean, my goodness. So I'm thinking, man, I can drop 8 pounds in probably, I can drop 8 pounds in 2 weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finally get back to doing my life again, back to being active, <clears throat> I just got to stay active. <clears throat> you don't have to go to the gym and work out. Just get up off of that thing. That's all you, <laughs> that's all you got to do. <laughs> get up off of that thing. Yeah. <coughs> sure, darling. So I just <coughs> want to share something. Um, it's, you know, obviously, Randy hasn't been able to be, go to the gym like he normally does and all of that. And the doctors walk in and they, you know, he, Randy's concerned he's got 10 pounds on him. And I'm thinking, good gosh, Randy, you look amazing. And I, uh, he was telling me, and I said, Matt, I've got to tell Matt this. The doctors that come in, the only one that looks really good to me in the sense I'm not overweight is Dr. Chastain. But the rest of them are all cardiologists and they are about 25 to 30, 40 pounds overweight. 
And of course, I, was, I said, Randy, you're the one that's dealing with all of this, and they're telling you you need to take care of yourself, but they're the ones that are all overweight and don't, don't look healthy. And I thought, of course they're going to say, man, Randy, you look great, because Randy does look great, you know? To but you. I, no, you do look great. That's the truth. Um, but Excuse I want me a moment. Let's find if that's true. Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> But I, I wanted to share something about this. <laughs> I wanted to share, you know, as a wife's perspective, you know, like last night, Randy was saying, you know, I'm not the one that had the heart attack. And I agree, I'm not the one that had the heart attack. But I go through what he's going through. I feel what he's feeling. I also feel extremely helpless and powerless when I see his suffering. Like, I know right now that um, Lisa is hurting for you, Bobby. Um, because we don't want to see our loved ones go through this pain, uh, this discomfort. And to feel powerless is the worst feeling ever in the world. But I've got to share just a, a funny story that happened. So Rennie's given these very intense, and we got some amazing stuff if you need it, Bobby. <laughs> this really intense pain medication. Um, and it's a narcotic, oh, hydroxycodone. <clears throat> yeah. And he still has it from uh, January. He's hardly taken them because he does not like taking them. <clears throat> well, anyway, uh, Rennie's recovering from the surgery of the actual surgery, but he's experiencing this nerve pain, which has got nothing to do with the sternum or the incision. It's a different, this is a nerve <coughs> pain, which is, a nerve pain is different to a normal pain. Well, anyway, so, um, you know, if Randy starts doing anything like sitting in a chair like this causes that pain because what it's doing is it's putting you in an angle to where you're putting that pressure on your pectoral, believe it or not. And to sit back where you're stretching it out doesn't cause the pain. So that's why it's easier for him sitting in a recliner. Now, I'm not saying with the legs up, just sitting in a recliner removes the pressure off of the pectoral. Tomorrow night, Reese. So Sitting in this chair, as if you looked at Randy, you would see he's leaning forward. It puts the pressure on. Well, I bought these re this recliner um, that Rob helped me put in the house. And it does not have the same angle, so it tends to cause him pain. So as the night proceeds, he's from a sitting position, he just slowly starts going back. Well, I'm sitting there one day, and... Well, let me go back a little bit. And Dr. Chastain always calls me, always checking up <coughs> on Randy. How's Randy doing? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? And I said, well, now, you know, we've got the cardiovascular surgeon. We've got the cardiologist. And then we've got Dr. Matchell, who is the one that's going to do the um, You know Dr. Matchell? Ablation. OK, that's the guy on the ablation. I'm not <coughs> sure. It's M-A-T-C-H-E-L-L, -L, Matchell. Really nice guy. But anyway. I said, well, you know, sir, Randy's in a lot of pain. He says, well, does he take his pain medication? I said, well, he says, now listen, you need to tell Randy that he's not going to get a badge at the end of the day. And I said, yes, sir, well, I understand that, and, and I will relay that to him. So we're in the living room. <laughs> you never relayed that to me. I, I did. I did tell you. Just right now? No, no, I told you then. You just, right yeah, I told you, but <laughs> I told you. And so anyway, we're in the living room when we're watching a series on TV. <coughs> and he says, man, I'm in so much pain. And I looked at him, I said, well, did you take any Tylenol? And he goes, oh, I didn't think about it. I don't. See, that's the I problem. I didn't think about it. I'm like, honey, when you start getting into pain, take some Tylenol. He says, oh, no, I just, I just didn't think about you know, it's it. It's funny. You know? It's not how I think. I never have. I'm 73. I've never thought the way I'm thinking now. It's, a, it's a, an intrusion, if you would, to me, well, we that I'm trying to adapt to, yeah. trying to look at the wisdom of God behind it. Well, we both don't. I mean, we never even had a general practitioner until <clears throat> this. I mean, right. we've never taken medication. But to me, my thinking is it's all short term. I'm not thinking that this is something he's going to be on for years. I'm looking at this as an aid and a support in the recovery because the body <coughs> is under so much duress. And I said to Randy, the duress is you're having these intense spasms. Now, you've got to imagine, this is nerve pain. This is not like an, a little twitch in a muscle that's sore or an incision. Nerve pain is probably the worst pain that you can experience. So he's having this nerve pain. 
It's then causing him to have high blood pressure because any time your body's in pain, your blood pressure goes up. Then they tell him you need to ice, and, uh, ice this and put heat on it. Well, when he puts the heating pad on it, he goes into <laughs> AFib. <laughs> so we're kind of like chasing all of this, you know, and I, and I see it and I understand it. But as a wife, I'm just going, honey, it's just for a season that we need to do certain things that aids and supports your body in the recovery process. Because look, I don't want a husband that's on medication for the rest of his life. That is not where I am. I, my faith is in the Lord that every little medication he's taking, it's faith towards God on that situation that I'm trusting. We're not going to have the side effects. We're not going to go... God, you've predestinated this. You've ordered our steps. We're going to follow this out. And then, like right now, June the 8th is my day. I, I was telling Amy to, I said, June the 8th, it's a new beginning because I am in such faith that all of this is going to be over. The pain, the nerve pain, the um, AFib, the high blood pressure, that's where my faith is. My faith is in God, but I do know that God gives us men that have created something that can aid and facilitate and helping the human body get to a place to where you don't need it anymore. So, Bobby, if you need some Tylenol, there's Tylenol right there in my purse. Extra strength. I don't know if that will help you. Okay, I'm sorry, but anyway. So, I'm hoping that, uh, I, I believe very strongly what Lisa said. Uh, there are millions of Christians that uh, deny the medical field uh, to their own demise. It's, I, I, I tell you, uh, as, uh, it's, to me, it's the spirit of Antichrist. It's denying healers. Now, let me flip that coin for a moment <clears throat> and say, what would be the difference if you're dealing with the word healer? How can you disassociate the term healers from Christ, regardless of how the healing comes? Does that make sense to you? I would say it this way then, maybe this would. <clears throat> that if, if there is a, any form of healing that takes place in your body, Christ is behind it. It's a healing because he's a healer. And they can't heal. They just want to put you on a journey so that God can do what he's always done whether they believe in God or not. And that you, what you and I have sitting here tonight is miraculous. Because our bodies, I, I told Matt and, and James today, I said, he didn't, Christ didn't, but he could have, could have. When they mocked and said, physician, heal thyself, he could have. Yeah. You follow me? Your body will heal itself. It is absolutely marvelous, this body, fearfully and wonderfully made, if you will cooperate with it. And so, you might not, what was the name of that, that uh, pain pill? Uh, oxycodone. So Matt asked me basically, well, what's the difference between oxycodone and, and, and Tylenol? You can sell the oxycodone. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? You, you, you can sell the oxycodone for a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, to Matt, I didn't have an answer. You know, it's just a pain pill. And somehow it was different with me. Are you following me? But you didn't like the way it made you feel. It no, I don't. It, I have to tell you now. And, and I, we were both guarded that, that about it. That sucker's got yeah. some serious kick to it. Yeah. Right. I don't like to be kicked around by any drug. <laughs> so. Well, Randy just found himself very spaced out because they were giving him two every eight hours. And at the beginning, he was taking it, and we slowly weaned off and said, could we just take Tylenol, because his body responds so well to Tylenol. So we did that. And I mean, now we've, I don't think we have any left anyway, but um, oh, he just didn't. I have thousands of dollars left. <laughs> I'm going to get it to Lisa, and she and I going to make some money. <laughs> no, I went, and got, I went and looked at it today. We, I've got a huge amount of it. I just haven't been taking it. And because, uh, like I said, it's uh, some of this stuff... Uh, you know, I love what we talked about, another brief conversation, if we may, but uh, of the three brothers, myself and the two Hesters, and we, talk, we talked about, you just can't throw all your wisdom and, and counsel to, uh, to the wind. Now, when you get confused, I have three doctors, 
Yeah, you've got to weigh things out. You've got to see, search the Lord even on what they say. You can't just do everything they say. But here's what Matt said that absolutely made sense. <clears throat> he said these are specialists, three different specialists in three different fields. They're going to give you the opinion of what medicine you should take outside his field because he's been in it for so long. Are you following me? But if you want to know which one to take, do the guy that does that. And so <clears throat> you don't want the guy handling the pharmacies uh, doing the open heart surgery. But you could ask, oh, yeah, we'll go in there. We'll just cut your chest open. Oh, I'd like to talk to somebody else, please. You know. So that's what Matt's saying. You've got to be wise on if you're asking questions, you can talk to me, Randy. I'll help you ask the right guy. I'll tell you, because you don't want all three of them telling you about medicine. You don't want all three of them telling you what you should do. <clears throat> I found out it conflicts already. I talked to two doctors. They said the, uh, uh, what's that? A, 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 ablation. ablation will reduce your blood pressure. The other doctor says, no, it won't at all. So what do you do with that? You see, these are, these are three professional doctors. Now, <clears throat> truth of the matter is, uh, I don't really know and care. The, the problem or, or the issue is, is, is primarily you've got to be, you've just got to be prudent. You've got to weigh things out before the Lord. And you've got to ask him what you're doing. This is not about uh, trusting man or the arm of man. This is trusting God with your life. See, now I'm going to make something clear in, the, in the, my final statement, and we'll make a change here. <clears throat> I'm not interested in the doctors. I'm not interested in the medication. I'm not interested in anything. I just want to know what God wants me to do. If Jesus, I told Matt today, if Jesus told me to go to hell, I'm going to hell. I don't know what I'll do when I get there, but I'll find out when I get there. I'm not going to stay because I've been born again, but you follow me. I just want the will of God. I never care who I'm supposed to marry, where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do. Some reason I made a distinction this time. That's all I did. I don't really care now. <clears throat> I got before him repentant repented days and said, you don't really care. But I'm not going to throw away my right to decide. I'm not going to throw away my right to think, and I'm not just going to go through the will to be syndrome of the doctors telling me I'm not going to do it. I'm not jumping off the cliff. <clears throat> so I'm not, uh, uh, that may be rebellious and stubborn, still could be, but I'm still going to maintain my prudence and my right to make a decision for my own body. Now this may sound a little, maybe this will help everybody. Uh, this can be a little out there, but this ain't your body. You didn't go through this. I did. You don't know what you would do. You don't know what decisions you would make. But when it happens to you, you have to be you to make that decision. I can't do what Crystal tells me and the doctors tell me and all the church tells me and everybody else tells me because they've all got an opinion what they would do. Here's the difference. What you would do is a problem because you're not me. So I have to get back down to one thing. All right, Jesus. <clears throat> What did you tell me to do? What did you tell me to do? Stop using your left hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. And I want you to know, I wish that would soak through a lot faster to this stubborn mind. I, uh, I need to, when I walk, I put it in my pocket. Uh, Chris was talking about a sling, and you know, put your arm in a sling. That's what uh, Bruce Garraway said tonight, was put in a sling. But anyway, yeah, I, I'd like to get that one fast, a lot faster. Somehow I'm not picking that one up. But, uh, but anyway, so that's what, kind of where we're at. I've got some more decisions to make. Uh, they're not really, be very, I have to hear as an elder what I've learned, I really don't have any decisions to make. I just have a decision to represent. I just get before the Lord and ask Him what He wants me to do. And if that's how He leads me, I'm going to do it. So... You all can agree with me that God is right now got His hand on me, on others, and Lisa, and Bobby, and, and on a number of other, uh, Raymond, and, and I think it was uh, Pam that called Bruce, and Pam called me today, and you know, there's others that's, so that we need to uh, see a lot of recovery here. So, <clears throat> all right. Yeah, faith and patience. Faith and, and did you know, and, and did you know, when I was praying uh, and asking the Lord, do you want me to go this way? That's exactly 
what I got. Randy, you're going to need a lot of faith and patience now. And most of it is that patience have her perfect work. I saw this is going to be an element of time. And studying the demon, demon experience I had in California was based upon the revelation of Macrothemy and Hupomene. And that revelation was when you talk about patience, it is the tool or the weapon of choice that kills the element of time. And you kill the element of time and surrender it, you will have no death. And so I knew patience was the key to Randy, but I, but I threw that away a little bit. I disconnected, see, from that. Because what Matt and James brought to my attention was the mistake you made was not in the post. You believe he sent you there, get the operation, you got it, now you got home and you got it. Well, I took my life back. And I decide what I'm going to do and not do, what I'm going to take and not take, and I'm going to live and not live. And I never re- kept under. I never know. That, what was it you told me to do? You know, so at that point, so I don't know. I, I, I'm glad today was a great day. Pam's uh, word, uh, would, would y'all like to hear it? I have to admit it's pretty profound. I have to admit it. And Pam, if you're still lif- listening, uh, I'm going to read this, but I really would ask you to find another church after this. Now, this is really profound. Now, you got to keep in mind, this came before Matt and uh, uh, James came to my house. <clears throat> and Crystal talked to me yesterday about what we're talking about right now. Randy, you, you've, you've just come out from what you're not doing what uh, the Lord's told you to do. Well, I, I thought I wasn't doing what the doctors were telling me to do because I had no longer choosing that way. You follow me? Well... <clears throat> I love the way she said this too. She texts, she sends it to Crystal before it comes to me. <clears throat> and she says, Crystal, if you think this is appropriate, please share this with Randy. If not, just please delete it. <laughs> but now she starts talking to me. I'm watching tonight from home because of a heart issue I just got out of the hospital with. I would like to ask you to please consider your approach on taking medication. If you want, if you went before the Lord, <laughs> and acquired his advice with the next move for his body after the heart attack. Then concerning surgery, why not acquire from the Lord about the medication and the road of recovery that he desires for you? All things are done in times and seasons according to the will of the Father. We as sons and daughters don't get to pick and choose what part of our Father's will we will want or do. If we stay in submission, obey and follow his plans, then we stay covered and behind the hedge and stay behind the hedge of protection by our Father. At that time, no weapon formed against us will prosper. If we think we can pick and choose our obedience, then we leave a break in the covering or the hedge. Satan would like to set small traps for use using our mind, setting sets. Our mindsets, paradigms that we pick up by our knowledge or by the trails of life. But not submitting those mindsets to God, or maybe times and seasons or adjustments we need to make, <clears throat> can open a door not meant to be opened. I understand we are all different in our approach to doctors and medication. I respect your position. All I'm asking is for you to submit the recovery of his body as you have the beginning of it. Well, that's pretty profound. And that's what, uh, let me uh, finish reading here. It's what Matt was saying today that you come out under that third stage. The recovery stage you thought was just, it's over, it's just fine. It's going to be a process, patience. It's going to take some time. I know you had a great testimony of God showing up in the hospital But don't limit him showing up again on your behalf concerning your recovery. God always has something for you, recovery, health, healing, something for him. And you're reaching one of his children, you reaching one of his children that needs something of the Lord that you can give, is what you said tonight. More than for my recovery, it's to, because I do believe with all my heart, this is an area that has never been talked about in the body of Christ. And that's why uh, it's either you're either for doctors or you're against them as a Christian. And uh, if you're for them, the, the Christians against you don't like it, and they think you've compromised your faith and you're living carnally. And then the flip side is, you follow me? It's just, it's ridiculous. 
Healers are healers, and they all come from Jesus Christ from one degree or another. All liars come from Satan, and all truth comes from Christ. So if a guy's lying, it's a Satan. If a guy's telling you the truth, it's Christ. So what's the difference? You know, a healer or a killer. <clears throat> so she reads on and said, um, if nothing I have learned is, for, is the Lord work in, that He works in mysterious ways. Then she prayed, Lord, I pray tonight, open the doors and methods of recovery for Randy that you desire. Let your way be clear to him. Give him the strength and ability to overcome. Amen. Precious, is it not? That was a, uh, I copied it and put it in my notes, took it just out of my, off the text so I wouldn't delete it sometime. I thought it was profound. Now what you have to look at is in the mouth of two or three. Yeah. Crystal started with me yeah. yesterday. Pam sent this last night. Mm -hmm. Last night, James and Matt come over today and called me and said, uh, can we talk? They're troubled. And they both talked to me about uh, disconnecting, coming out from under the will of God for recovery. You took your own life up, Randy. I saw it when they said it. And I said, yeah, I didn't see that as, well, thank you, Jesus. I got it from here. I, you know, I quoted that wonderful scripture that what God has promised, I'm able to perform. <laughs> Anybody ever confess that one? <laughs> I got it from here, Jesus. I got this. And uh, that's been a lot of my own uh, firstborn of independence that I've dealt with all my life. So, you know, you still deal with these, uh, your personalities and the way you are. Now look, at 723... Everybody's been healed. The marriages all got healed last night, so I think we're just finished. Do you have anything else to say? I'm with you, Lord. You're with me? Mm -hmm. You're reflecting my glory? Okay. I just ran out of glory. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> huh? You'll make your own. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can do that. All right, I do want to bring up a little something. It's, uh, are you all still okay? I mean, it's, it's a... Three nights, you know, I mean, sure we can put up with three nights, can't we? We have eternity. We do have eternity. <clears throat> I'm only doing this now, you know, about three times a year, so I'm grateful for a little time tonight. <clears throat> and I, I really was advised that this was not a wise thing for me to do. And, but I'm going to say something here on that as well. Uh, it was all about uh, reducing the stress in your life right now so you can recover faster. Well, that's common sense. I understand that. <clears throat> Keep, you know, stress, get your blood pressure up. Keep it down. You recover faster. I don't, so, but I never have seen myself ministering at the church in Marshall as stressful. Uh, if I was an autocratic pastor, I have to tell you, there'd be a lot of stress on me right now. Uh, you got to be there. You got to do it, and you get paid to do this, and that's what they pay you to do, and you you know, and all, the, and the list goes on. I don't have any of that. In fact, uh, when the doctors asked me about the ministry and the stress level, I couldn't hardly explain it to them. See, they saw it as I'm the pastor, so you need to, and I couldn't explain it to them. No, I, I only carry a small portion of the weight here in this house. I just stay in my lane. I just own my own Metron. I, I don't do what uh, Byron does, Jeff does, Ray does, Dwayne does, Ralph does, Lynette does. And, and I do want you to know, if I did what Ralph Lynette do, does do, I would have done better last night. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. Just, I'm just trying to say something to encourage you all, Ralph. Ralph, you did great last night. So, so <laughs> <laughs> You need a volume, son? <laughs> No, I appreciated, well, I appreciated your heart, both of y'all, on exactly what was God. It, it, to me, it's the words. It's what he was saying. And, and it was, we're bonded together in love. And I tell you, that was exactly what the word was all about. So I wouldn't worry about it. I'm just like that. I'll hit a song when I know I can't sing. I don't care. If I really believe it's a song, then if you could just take it to, it's the same thing up here right now. If y'all can handle my weakness, I feel strong in the Lord. My body, I don't put much mind on right now. I don't, I don't really care about that. I really believe my spirit man can rule it all. That being said, just triggered me. I want you to get your Bible and look at a scripture. That did. That just triggered me right there. He brought me right into that. I want to take you somewhere tonight on the marriage, a little differently, if I may. <clears throat> and uh, Crystal talked last night, is she not, primarily about the husband and wife and their soul being bonded together. How you flow together in personality and your humanity, how you work together in your beliefs and your differences. Uh, and it's entirely different than just being spiritual. 
And I want to say this to this to you. I have counseled divorces that would not have divorced if the woman would have listened to me. Now we're talking about when the women do it. Look at my hand, how bruised it is. What did you do, darling? <clears throat> hey, George, what did you do to your hand? Did George do this? <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Well, anyway, yeah, I just had a moment in the backyard, Bobby. It was a precious moment. I, there's sometimes you want to make contact uh, with your four-wheeler. Uh, it's, it's for the right reason. You know, you haven't been with it for through the winter, and so I made physical contact with my four-wheeler last night. That's all. <coughs> now, <coughs> look at Proverbs 15, 4. <clears throat> I'm going to read it to you in the King James, and I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Amplified. A gentle tongue with its healing power is a tree of life, but willful contrariness in it breaks down the spirit. You and I both know if we travel the word right now on what I've grown up with, which is faith and confession, then we go right to death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Well, that is a truism, but now here's what I want to bring out in marriages. Our words and how we speak to one another, how we answer one another, how we say something to one another can breach the spirit, not the soul only, but something happens deep of the heart in the spirit. Now, I'm going to give you an example uh, of my bruised fist. (laughs) I'm not doing good, and I'm mentally fading. I'm struggling with some issues. So I thought I'd get out in the back, health issue. I thought I'd get out in the backyard. And I, we have a, we, we spend a lot of time and money in our backyard with plants and flowers. And, and Frankie helps us keep it all nice. And well, for four months, I haven't been there. We've lost dozens and dozens of plants. Things got out of control. Weeds are taking over my garden. And there's nothing I can do about it right now. I, don't ha- I can't stay out there and be out there long. So... Uh, beast of the field came and multiplied. So I'm out in the backyard, and uh, now it would be very helpful. She has a four wheel, and I have one, and we have these little four foot by five foot trailers, and we we start picking stuff up. I couldn't get her started. It's been the winter, been sitting out there. I couldn't get my. Oh, I still got it on battery charge. So I got mine, uh, and it wouldn't start. And I tried and tried and tried, and I got frustrated. George began to give me a hand to get him started. (laughs) George is always helpful in getting something started. Because by the time he gets it started, you're going to have to buy some new parts. (laughs) Isn't that about right? (laughs) So I'm out there, and I got frustrated, and I walked away. I just walked away from it. And Crystal just came out of the back door with some uh, real ice, cold water and refreshment for me and all that. And she said, Randy, and I said, what? And it it wasn't against her. I was just frustrated. It just came right out of George. Didn't even think about it. It hurt her. It hurt her. It went, that word right there will go down into the breach in spirit. Well, I was going to teach on this two weeks ago, and it happened the the day before I taught it. (laughs) I I created my own. And it kind of seems to be that way, which is fine, because I don't mind using my own life. I don't mind saying, okay, I had a moment. I didn't think. I got, he got out of the cage. He broke the yoke, and my wife paid for it. Well, it hurt her. Then when we were talking, I said, Chris, I just want, I'm very sorry. I said, it wasn't against you. I shouldn't have done it, but it had nothing to do. You took it personally. I thought it wasn't you. I said, I just took it out on you. I apologize for that. <clears throat> and I said, when you see that with me, maybe rather than take it personal, oh, yes, Randy, are you okay? Or what's wrong with you? Because you know it's not personal. And that might help. I told that would give me a little help at that time to bring that guy back under. Because I got irritated, got frustrated, got mad out there. And uh, I've known Jesus Christ for 53 years, teach the Marisbos, and, and got mad yesterday. Are you following me? I mean, what was that you lady saying? How deep is he, Arlene? Three inches, isn't it? One, what is it? 
Half an inch. Esau's only one. They sang a song on the river. Esau's only half an inch under the, under the uh, you know, rather than six feet. Esau's only a half an inch under that dirt. And uh, I think it was about a quarter, of maybe even an eighth yesterday. <laughs> it didn't take him long to come up. And I felt sorry, but that's what happened. Now, I didn't change this message based upon that experience. I had this word before the experience. So I thought, well, I'll just be open, naked and open before you and let you know that when you, when you, as it says here, a wholesome tongue, King James, and then uh, amplified a gentle tongue with its healing power. Well, there's no healing in that. That was destructive. So when we do that to one another, this is a breach in the spirit, not just a breach in the soul. Her soul wasn't just her, her spirit woman was. It, it shuts you down. It, it closes you up. You, you become silent and, and uh, it can be reversed. She could say something like that to me and, and it, it's an incredible, it just shuts me down. I just, I mean, it's a crazy thing what it does to me, different to me than her, but because we're different people. But if she says it to me or I say it to her, and the thing that I want to bring out is a breach in the spirit. Now let me take you to some things for a moment that is damaged in a marriage. Now we're talking about we were brought together by Christ. Our whole marriage is based upon our relationship to Jesus, not our relationship to one another in the flesh. The preeminence of our success of our marriage is in the spirit, not in the soul ties. We thank God for the soul ties. It makes living easier with humans. But when you are in sync with Christ and then in sync with one another in soul, it's, it's heaven. It's miraculously heaven. And we have that. <clears throat> now we have breaches. And I thought I would bring out tonight the reality of all marriages have breaches. And a breach is a violation of a promise or a violation of something in that you violate. Something happens that causes a violation in the spirit world. It's not just an offense or sin. You violate something in the spirit world. The word that, that we're, I'm talking about here is the word breach. And a breach is something that is a broke, something breaks. Something literally breaks. Now you take a unity of common ingredients. Give you an example: a plate, uh, a a, cu a cup. If you break that plate, it's one item being broken, not two separate anything. That one, all that is one. You follow me? It's just a plate. Now, if it was different ingredients and it was all separate, it would be different. It's not. You broke the plate. Now when that happens, that's a breach there. There's a violation that takes place. <clears throat> and here's what I've learned. I, ha I have a great beautiful uh, privilege. I've, uh, I'm not like the Apostle Paul. He was man always, he was, he shared, shared it a number of times, that he was a man born out of season. When you believe that you're born out of season is that you do not have the revelation of your season. And I'm not criticizing the Apostle Paul, make that clear. But I'm a man who knows my season. I understand my season. And I have one foot in my father's uh, culture and generation, <clears throat> and I have <clears throat> my foot in this next culture and generation. So let me take you through cultural change for a moment and let you see where I'm coming from. My daddy's day and age, Jeff's mom and dad and Shelly, not his mom and dad, but Shelly and his mom and dad, <clears throat> ours, when something was broke, we fixed it. Nobody even thought of that. You fix it. Today, with the younger generation, if it breaks, you get rid of it. Don't even think about fixing it. Just get rid of it. Then you get another marriage and you, something breaks it in, and you get rid of her and get another woman, and that breaks, you get another one. And I want you to know you can go through a hundred of them. Because in every marriage you have, you're going to break something. There's going to be a breach. And when, you, when it breaks with Christ, what do you do? You fix it. You, you look at fixing it. Well, same, huh? It's got to have value. If it doesn't have the value, you don't want to fix it. It's that's got right. to have the value, and that's the thing. Uh, you know, if you look at the world now, it doesn't view uh, marriages as valuable, but in the kingdom of God, it's highly valuable. And you know, we want, we need to fix our marriages, not just 
get rid of the mate and get someone else, because you'll just reproduce <coughs> the same thing again and again and again. So you believe that you can only fix it if it has a certain value to you to fix it? If you were born again and you love Jesus Christ, your ma marriage should be extremely valuable to you. Now, I'm talking about people in the kingdom. So yes, right, so right, you, will, right. you will fix it. But if you look at the world, the world does not uh, think of marriages as valuable or worth fighting for. The minute there's discourse or disunion or breach or fracture, instead of them taking the time to repair that, they'll rather get rid of that person and go find someone else and then build something else. But with the kingdom of God, with Jesus Christ, you want to fix that breach. As you know, we will breach sometimes <clears throat> from the Father in our disobedience. Um, I will breach with you when I've angered you or vice versa. But the relationship is so important to Christ and to you that you want to fix it. You don't want to walk around with that breach to where eventually you have no marriage and you will discard it and go find someone else. When you have a breach, <clears throat> if you are wise in your marriage, you will start fixing that breach immediately. And I'm going to tell you why. Every breach leads to no more value, yes. the loss of value and premium in that marriage or that person. And once a breach takes its course, divorce is inevitable because you didn't fix the breach. And every man and woman in this house that's been divorced, you will go back tonight and look at the day that you noticed that, new, that you were no longer loved or appreciated or respected. You will know your mate has changed the value system in that relationship, and you no longer have that value or that premium that you had before. If you can fix that, and by the way, the, the difficulty is it takes two. It does. I mean, it, it, it just one person can't do it. But if you can see... My value starts off, and here's an interesting term. You have to get the term value and premium. Does your relationship to Christ have value and premium? When do you backslide? When what? When you lost that value of that relationship. He's no longer loved like he loves. He's no longer respected and honored like he was. You no longer seek him or pursue him like you did. Because even with God, you lose the value and the premium of that spiritual relationship. Most of the time on backsliding because you go narcissistic and you want your own life. You choose your own life back. Well, when the moment you choose your own life, there's no value with that life. So value is a primary issue in a marriage. And value doesn't come from your premium. Value comes from his premium. If I chose her, I will have problems with value. But if he chose her for me, I will not have difficult with premium. The reason is he retains it. I don't have to have dinners and flowers and chocolates and roses to try to keep that value. I have it already in Christ. And if there's a problem, he immediately goes to work to fix his own situation. And that's what I love about him. That's what I love about being married in the will of God. That's what I love about Isaac Rebecca. Christ himself watches over that to see to it that it becomes successful. He himself will. <clears throat> it's easy to divorce in the natural if you marry in the natural. Eventually you're going to have some problems and it just, it's easy to move on to the next one. But one of the things I will tell you that I know all these years, 73 years on the earth, 53 with Christ, I could marry a hundred women, I'm still going to marry a soul. You follow me? So it really doesn't matter. You're still going to go through the same thing. I've gone through it different with Gloria than Crystal, but Gloria had a soul too. <clears throat> Gloria had her own independence and her own self-will at times. Maybe y'all didn't see it all, but I lived with it behind the scenes. There was times it was not easy either. And it surely wasn't easy with me because I'm very deep and complex. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh boy. I'm not narcissistic, am I? Thank you, daughter. So now moving on. The, here's what I want to bring up is that there are three primary factors here in this breach of the Spirit. You have to understand the DNA of the Holy Spirit. The DNA of the Holy Spirit, and I've given it, you know, divine nature's attributes. There are certain divine nature attributes that defines exactly who He is. The same as our DNA 
right? It specializes in defining you. And if there's anything they want to know if you're male or female, DNA. <clears throat> and it's going to tell you every single time. So there are certain laws of nature, uh, biological laws, uh, physiological laws, spiritual laws that are, cannot and will not be uh, broken, altered. It will not be broken or altered. My covenant will I not break nor alter the things going down on my lips. God cannot change. He cannot be altered. He cannot, he cannot refute. In other words, He can't. You follow me? So that's a fact. Now you're dealing with absolutes. And when you deal with DNA in, in the spirit, a breach in spirit, you have to ask what breaches. And there are three primary DNA factors uh, to God's divine nature, and you've heard them for years, the three L's. Life, light, love. These are the three primary DNA factors that motivates, governs God's behavior. He is eternal life. He is life. I am the resurrection and I am Zoe. So that's life. That's the DNA. Now we know there's a difference between our temporal life on the earth and our eternal life with Christ. And God is love. That's who He is. In Him was life, and the life was the light. So Zoe produced folks. Light produces Life produces light. So now let's reverse it. I breach in spirit. Yesterday or day before, I don't know when, was it yesterday? I said that or day before? Day before, day before yesterday <clears throat> when she comes out on the patio, Randy, what? At that point, <clears throat> what actually is it says happens, it calls it a breach where? In the spirit relationship. That's what the scripture calls it. The unhealthy tongue should have been healthy. It wasn't wholesome. It wasn't a healer, it was a killer. Death and life. Are you following me? So your tongue and how you speak to your wife or your maid is either going to kill or heal. You have to face that fact. That's all, that's the only two options that you have. Every time you open your mouth, you'll either encourage or discourage. You'll either strengthen or weaken. All of that is there. You'll either oppress or depress or, or uh, one way or the other. Something's going to happen. You're going to either put them down or lift them up. Are you with me? There's no other choice. So we reverse it now. I want to find out what I just did. I know what I said. I know the spirit in which I said it. <clears throat> now I want to know what did I do. All right, let's go with it for a moment. <clears throat> you have a breach in spirit. What happens if you reverse life? Death. What happens if you reverse light? Darkness. What happens if you reverse love? hatred. So now all three things her spirit felt. She felt the darkness of that word. She felt the death of that word. And she felt deappreciated and devalued by those words. Yes or no? Immediately happened to her. She maybe didn't take time and filter all that like I've, I've studied and meditated, but that's what she felt. She felt that death hit her. She felt that devalue hit her. The way I spoke to her, she had no value. Who do you think you're talking to? I'm your, I'm your wife. And when God chose you, well, who are you? You know, you've got that thing on you. So all three of those have been reversed. And when she does it to me, if she counters me, if I say something, and she counters me with that abrupt, you know, thing, then I feel the same thing. I feel devalued immediately. I feel like I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. She's the only wise person on the earth, and I'm the stupid one. That's what goes through you all. Anybody ever feel that? Come on, I'm talking to my family here. We can do this to one another, can we not? And so that's how you feel. <clears throat> well, when I feel that way, uh, it's not a good feeling for me. She's going to hear from me. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to let her know I'm not that stupid. I don't see myself stupid, ignorant, or none of the above. And I'm not going to be brought down by someone else's words. And how they... So we talk all of this. Uh, I'm not the smartest guy, but let me tell you what I do know. <clears throat> I'll tell you what I do know. Senator Kennedy. Anybody know him? Senator Kennedy on con at Congress. He said, he helped us as Americans not to be that stupid. He said, I know that the Americans are poor under Biden's administration, but we're not stupid. Well, that was kind of nice. I mean, it was helpful. You know, you 
you're a whole lot poorer, but you're, you're really not stupid. So see, I'm seeing where he's going with this. I loved it. So then he goes on and he says, Biden has announced that he's going to run for a second term. But the American polls have proven his popularity because his popularity in the polls in America rank right up there with jock itch. <laughs> <laughs> And that was, we're talking about a senator. We're talking about a senator at the White House. And I thought, wow, that's not exactly a lot of value, is it? So really, if that's really the case, and by the way, a lot of people have that devalue to this administration. Uh, do they not? Of course, I'm not asking you. I mean, we're answering for other people. Right? I mean, what we? <laughs> so, but it, the same thing happens. What happens is because of what's being said and being done, America has lost its value. What they did to defund the police has caused a great rebellion to authority. You follow me? It has reduced it. Now, the democratic cities are beginning to bring the police back in <clears throat> because they're just being robbed blind. Stores are shutting down. Walmart shutting down in cities. Man, I mean, we're talking about serious problems. <clears throat> so it's all about a value system. So one of the primary things in our marriage is that you don't want to lose is the value and the premium of your mate. Now, Crystal has to adjust to the fact I'm getting older. I think it was Ralph said it, what was it last night? Ralph, you talked about getting a little older, things happen. Things shut, wasn't you, who was it? Somebody sh shuts down, things begin, and they do. Changes take place. Well, whether Ralph said it or not, that, it's a truism. So Crystal has to adjust herself, being uh, 18 years younger than me, uh, and it, it is appointed once unto man to die. Well, I want to say something right there. I'll never die again. Isn't that wonderful? I'm one of the two prophets that will come back because I've already died. I fulfill, I fulfill the Scripture. So... <laughs> but the premium is when I struggle with my wife or she hurts me or whatever, I'm going to talk about what she does to me, I'll, I, if I do, when I finally get it behind me, I go back here and I said, but you gave her to me. You could have chosen a better for me. I could not have done better for myself. And what I do, I reinstate her value immediately knowing that in the breach, the thing that I must protect is the value. If I lose the value and the premium of this woman in the breach, I will divorce. We will divorce. It will, it's inevitable. It will head that route. Unless you have friends that take you to the Northwest <laughs> before it happens. Because they see the breaches. So when your friends see the breaches of your marriage and they come to you, Matt and James today uh, were sent by, by Christ as a Savior. They, were, they came to save me. They came to bishop my soul. They saw what I had made a mistake and they wanted to correct it. <clears throat> if you don't have friends like that, this mystery of iniquity will continue in your life and you, you can't correct yourself a lot of times. You guys know that, don't you? Nobody sees you better than your friends. And everybody here knows about my marriage. <clears throat> you know about her suke, you know my suke, you know her spirit, you know my spirit, you know her strength, you know my weakness, you know when she intimidates me, you know when I intimidate her. You, you go through all, you see all that. You see when I succumb and lost my manhood, or you've seen when I stood up and maintained my manhood. We go through all of that. Sometimes she cuts me and sometimes, sometimes I'm circumcised and sometimes I'm castrated. And uh, <laughs> I just like to know the difference. So <laughs> but it's true in a marriage when we deal that with a strong uh, 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 dominating wife, they will castrate their own sons or castrate their husbands. And, but what we're supposed to do, see, we've entered into a covenant of circumcision, not castration. And we are to cut the flesh out of this marriage. We are to confront one another. <clears throat> I'm to tell her, Crystal, don't speak to me like that. And she was to say to me, Randy, you know how it hurts me when you spoke to, speak to me like that? Well, then let's circumcise it, right? We don't have to, I don't have to be castrated. And, you know, Crystal, I'm so sorry. I, I'm, tell you, I'm so sorry. I sure hope you forgive me. And if we get back together again, I sure would like to make love later if we could. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> motive for repentance. I'm just throwing out the motive. <laughs> there was nothing pure in any of that. The man was working his angle. <laughs> but the issue is, now you see the value. Now, I've got some things I've written down here. I just want to show it to you and see. And then what you're going to do when I read this is you're going to examine your marriage. Okay, it is that it, now every uh, breach in spirit is an infraction caused by some violation of that human spirit. To understand violation of the human spirit, you have to understand that God is a spirit. That's why I gave you the three DNAs. You will violate life. You will violate light. You will violate love. You will violate all three of those when you breach that spirit, and you, you do that by the words that you speak. Death and life. You'll either heal or kill. Do you believe that? Well, since we do know that, it goes down deep into the spirit. <clears throat> now, what happens on a breach, there's more than a separation that takes place. A separation does take place. But there's a breach of covenant. Something else takes deeper than just a separation of the souls. Now you have a separation that takes place. Maybe it is with God or it's with your spiritual brother. I get offended at Shelley or something like that for calling me stubborn. Or I go ahead and say, that is true. I need to deal with that. And we don't breach. But then I get offended. Then I take him to the internet. Are you following me? Because now Shelly has no more value to me. He's worthless. One of the sons of Belial. I'm not saying that. I'm just using that as an example. <clears throat> so you're looking at, yes, does that happen? Yes, it does. Now I'm going to say something. I've, I've been at that door with Gloria, and I've been at that door with Crystal. And both times I've had a divine intervention. And if not, this, I mean, I was married my first year with Gloria Lee, and I've never experienced an encounter with uh, Isaac Rebecca. That was my first ever encounter in life, that God chose somebody for you. I've always chosen whatever I like, you know. And <clears throat> whatever that was is fine with me. Then I ask God to bless it. You know, choose something carnal and ask God to bless it. Think about that. <laughs> huh? How'd that well, I'll tell you how that worked out. I'll tell you how it worked out. I don't want to tell them how it worked out. <laughs> Let me just say it didn't come out very good. So, <laughs> so you wind up in Texas with a rifle, a clock, uh, and uh, a knife, and a pocket knife. And uh, yeah. well, that's, what, that's what I wound up with. After all the 12 years in California, that's what I wound up with, literally. And uh, that's crazy. But I want you to know something. It was a crocodile dundee type of knife. It, that's, oh, this is a knife. That was, they didn't have a knife. I had the knife. And I kept it with me. And by the way, I still have it. Still have it with me. Same 22. I have that. I have uh, uh, the knife and I have the clock. The clock I made when I was in California. So some things have value. Isn't it funny what is value, see? I didn't mean, mind leaving everything, but I wanted that 22. That, <laughs> that, that's crazy. I didn't think about it. Right? I wouldn't part with it to this day. Same thing, believe it or not, with my truck. I mean, my truck to this day retains an enormous amount of value to me. And my wife doesn't like my truck. She doesn't want to drive the truck. Did you know, honestly, that my wife doesn't like my truck? I have, I've never said it hurts me. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that overly sensitive? Don't you think it's overly sensitive, Shelly? So, let me just remind you, what did you say when we were driving to the hospital? You know, I'm not really enjoying driving this truck right now. Well, I'm not. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm having transmission problems. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to drive. It just won't shift. It just, I have to, so it's another story. But, but I it's, think it's relative to me. <laughs> but it's like that even when I drive it. I never no, it know, isn't. It I loves never you. Know it loves you. Drive. It shifts right up. Boom. I never know when I'm in drive, neutral, or reverse. And so help me, I was driving down the freeway and almost threw it into reverse on the freeway. I want to say this. I, I'm going to. I'm going to say this. This. This is. This has got to be said. We're on our way to Caddo. Jared is in the front seat. Crystal's driving. I'm laying down in the back seat. And she throws it up in reverse. 
and just throws me out in the floorboard. Just rolled me out in the floorboard. I'm sorry I can't find this gear. I said, well, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. So now I have to do it. It is, it is easy to put that. That's the one thing I don't like about the stick shift, that one I've got. It's easy to put that thing in reverse. Well, it shouldn't do it. You can't boy, see it. it no, you can't see it. It doesn't you gotta tell know, you you got to know where it's at. No. You, know? you got to have a feel for this thing. Man, it's like a marriage. You can't just learn it. You got to know it. No airbags. No, I you mean, don't need airbags. I'm not going to wreck. So let me ask you this. We're coming back from Cato one year. What do we use as air conditioning? Ice bags on our feet. Now look. In the truck. Look. It's in August. This, and I, and he this tells everybody, justifies some of that thinking. And he tells everybody, I want this truck when he dies. And I'm nobody, like, no, nobody, I really don't. And nobody wants it. I can't tell how many people I'm offering it. We were coming back. Air con- thank you, man. Thank you, being busy. I'll tell you. I come back from Caddo and my air conditioner went out. I'm not without creativity. We've made an image and likeness of God. I pull in the gas station. <clears throat> I buy a bunch of ice bags, put them in her floorboard, my floorboard, and turn the fans on on the floorboard. <laughs> I want you to know it worked like a champ, man. I'm not lying. Now, both the floorboards are both rotted out. But that's not important here. <laughs> huh? I still love you my still truck. Love you truck. know why I love my truck? Is it the same color as duct tape? <laughs> I was, it, listen to my story. You never heard the story. Now you'll, you'll understand my value system. I'm in Texarkana, married to Gloria Lee. We got nothing. No chairs, no beds, nothing. Crock pot. And that's all she's got. And she's pulled it off the uh, cabinet and knocked it on the floor and broke it, sat in the middle of the floor with the food crying because we didn't have nothing. No money, nothing. <coughs> and I'm over the sink cleaning it all up for her. And I'm looking into the sink. And she said, what are you thinking? I said, I'm going I'm to believe God for a brand new Toyota pickup truck. <laughs> that's what you're thinking? <laughs> yeah. That's what we need right now. We need a bed, Randy. We need chairs. We need a couch. And I, I'm just throwing my faith out there. I'm just throwing it out there. And she said, stop. She said, you're serious, huh? Yes. Sir. Yes, I have a moment. I just got a moment. I want a charcoal Toyota pickup truck with dove gray interior. I'm just asking the Lord for it. What is it you want? What is it you need? And when I said that, she said, what do you mean what I need? I said, I don't need a bed and chairs. I'm doing fine. And uh, our, our uh, what would you call it? Our chest of drawers for all of our clothes was sa- Safeway boxes that she taped together and stacked them on top of each other on her side in the, and on mine. And she had all of her underwear in these boxes. They're just boxes taped together, duct tape. That's how we started out our marriage. Well... What was funny was, years later, we moved to Naples, Texas, and ministering there. I get a, a real nice uh, Chevy pickup truck, and we drive it down here. And when I'm down here one day, a guy shows up at the office from out of Oklahoma. He's got a cherry red apple Toyota 4x4 pickup truck with that plush tan leather interior. Drives right up. Mr. Shankel here? Yeah, when I said, can I show you something? Yeah, I said, my wife, I said, I work, I own a place up in Oklahoma, sell Toyota. I heard that you were believing God for a Toyota pickup truck. I said, I am, sir. I most certainly am. said, let me show you something. He took me out there and said, is this the one? He said, no, I don't think that's your color, is it? I said, I'm not sure what's happening here. He said, I'm supposed to get you this Toyota pickup truck. Now, what color do you want? I said, well, sir, this is beautiful. No, didn't you, didn't, you, didn't you say you wanted a charcoal gray with dove interior gray? Yes, he said, we'll be back. He t- that, still got, that Underneath that truck is solid red. He took that brand new truck back to Oklahoma, had it sprayed charcoal gray, and right now where some of it's coming off, it's that red. It's underneath there. He took all the seat covers out, everything, and redid the whole thing in, char- in dove gray and brought it back and said, God's told me to give you this truck. <clears throat> Does it have value? Do you understand the premium? It has nothing to do with the truck. 
It has to do with what my father went through through the years from Texarkana to Naples to Marshall. Years. But he fulfilled that little dream, looking in that kitchen sink, cleaning up a crock pot mess. <laughs> so it has value. So everything that I have in life is because it's been given to me by God. The reason I don't want to get rid of it, I had this four-wheeler for 36 years. I can't get it started right now, but I wouldn't get rid of it for anything because I, it was a gift from God. So all that's been given to me has, has been given to me by God. I retain that value. So I don't need anything else. I don't need another truck. I don't need another wife. I don't need another four-wheeler. I just need to maintain and manage what I have. Oh, you follow me. I'm not one who covets and desires and has to have the new next thing out on the iPhone. I don't need that. I need a phone. I don't, I don't need anything else but a phone. My phone is used 90% of the time, Bible and King James, uh, uh, Bible, excuse me, and Strong's Exhaustive. That's 90% of what I use this thing for. Not even a phone for me. I may call my wife or text her, but <clears throat> most of it is nothing else. <clears throat> You got anything on this heart you want to speak up on, finish up on? Yeah, just, <clears throat> well, to go back to the uh, breach, um, a wife will know when she and her husband are breached because she will feel uncovered. And what I've learned in my marriage is that <clears throat> Randy can separate from me and I feel uncovered, but he won't necessarily feel the same way. <clears throat> and I heard this wonderful story, this um these young ladies were asking this older woman if there was one th treasure that she could share with them about marriage that would make it successful, what would it be? She said that you highly prize your husband and that when you are in a quarrel, it doesn't matter who's right and wrong, but you as a wife, because you honor and respect your husband, will be the first one to go in to repent because having your marriage in union is far more, far more valuable to you than being right. And I thought, yes, I don't want to be separated and breached with Randy. Like I did something today and I'd upset Randy and he, I could feel the breach. And I thought, I don't care whether I'm right or wrong. Being right or wrong is immaterial. I want to fix the breach because I love him and he's valuable to me. But as a wife, because your husband <coughs> is your head and your covering, when there's that breach, you feel that. You feel the separation. I've learned with Randy, I feel the disconnect but with Randy, he's very easy to go and mark you off. And I can't do that. I can't do that with relationships or with anything. I want to fix the breach. I want to go and in humility say, I'm so sorry for what I've said, for how I've hurt you. I want, I, I want to mend the fracture, the break that we have. And when I heard that story, I thought, man, that woman, that 90-year-old woman told them that it's more important to fix the breach than you trying to be right. And I thought, yeah, we're far too long. We want to be right about something. And you can be so right and cause so much death. <coughs> and um, so to fix the breach is more important. So I know that that's to me, you know. And it is to me with you. Now, <clears throat> I will say, <coughs> again, understanding each other as in our humanity. My personality uh, is entirely different than hers and probably anyone else in here. <clears throat> but I study her probably more than any person I've ever met in my life. I study her. It is within me by God that I am a, I'm a great student of knowledge. I search everything out. I, I don't care what it is. I research it as much as I can. Everything I'm going through right now, I will study it and research that doctor gives me a pill. When I get home, I research, what is this pill? What does it do? How does it do it? What are the side effects? How long are the side effects? I do all that. I want to know what I'm doing. I think uh, Matt calls it Dr. Google. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Dr. Google. I always confer with Dr. Google. Now, Dr. Google is not always right. But, and I know that. But it gives you enough information. If it goes into definition, you're not getting an opinion. You're getting a definition of appeal. So all that being said, the value, we go back to that value system and how that functions, knowing that she and I are entirely different. And the difference is, and I'm not justifying this. I'm going to make that clear. I think it's a negative trait. I don't really know. 
But almost all my life, I'm able to very easily detach emotionally uh, in an unhealthy relationship or being around unhealthy people, negative people, derogatory people, people who's always complaining, murmuring, or they got problems, or they're always, you know, evil, talking about the police, or they're talking about the government. I, don't, I mean, to all, all that's demonic. Uh, there's nothing but death in those words. So what I do, I just emotionally detach from that relationship. I've always been able to do that. And I didn't know that until I was in Naples, Texas. <clears throat> I'm ministering there, and there's a guy there that I really did not care for at all. <clears throat> and he really, he helped me understand me, because uh, he was a narcissist from way back. And you get around him, and he's going to talk about him. <laughs> and uh, boy, it was hard to listen to all that uh, self-grandeur. And so he makes an appointment for me to come in to be bishop one time. And I just laid it out there. I mean, I filleted the fish. I wasn't careful with it at all. I just filleted him. And I've heard that before. <laughs> That's what Matt was telling me about that. Just fillet him. That's what I did. Just fillet him out there. Yeah. <clears throat> and I filleted him. I said, look, man, you're a narcissist. That's all your problem is. It's all about you. Your whole life is about you. You're just using Jesus Christ for your benefit. So I went on and doing, doing that thing. And at, right there at the end, he said, he stands up and said, Randy. And he stands up and he leaves over and says, don't do this. That's what you're capable of doing right now with me. You're already doing it right now with me. And I went, what is that? He said, you are already detaching emotionally from this. You will no longer have a relationship with me when I walk out of this office. Ooh, it set me back. I was right about him, but I was about to handle him wrong. He didn't have a chance. But he'd have walked out. If he hadn't said anything, he would have never had a chance. <clears throat> years and years and years later, we're having an all uh, men's meeting down here, and we're we've all camouflaged. Got camo, we're mil warriors. We're going to, anybody remember the, some of those days? <clears throat> he comes down all in white with a red cross. <clears throat> And you know what that is? Anybody know? Oh, medical. Huh? Medical. medical. So he walks in. I said, what are you doing? He says, <clears throat> I knew there was going to be a lot of testosterone here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I thought I might just bring some healing with it. And he was right. Because, see, he said that knowing me, not knowing the meeting. <clears throat> He knows that I could fillet just as easy as I, I can kill just as easy as I can heal if I if I get into that wrong area. Because I can, you know, Crystal, you don't want to live with me? You want to talk to me like that? You want to help? I don't need that. And I'm through. I can go on about my business. I won't look back. Now that's not, that's when I've lost that type of value. She knows that. I don't use that as a, a threat to her, but she does know that I have a characteristic that I'm not going to date or marry pain. I'm not going to be around people that's constantly hurting you or demeaning you or putting you down. or I'm not, I don't need it. And I, I have this that I've learned years ago. There's some things, and I found it to be biblically solid. I don't want to be around negative people. That's just death. Then I don't want to be around anybody that doesn't choose me because they're not worth me trying to win. You follow, you're trying to win people. Well, a man persuaded, persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. If i got to persuade Byron to stay here and love me, how long is that going to last? It won't last. He has to make that decision. So I want a woman that chooses me. I don't want a winner. I don't have to win her. I don't, have to, I don't want to have to buy stuff for her to stay with me. I don't want to have to buy the diamonds and the rings and the clothes and the houses and the cars and the vehicles. I don't want to do that. If that's the reason she's not married to me, she's married to my wealth or what I can do for her. So I don't want a woman married to me what I can do for her. I want a woman that loves me, that has value and premium in me whether I do anything. Christ has value and premium in every one of us, and He doesn't require any of us to do anything to get it. We got it while we, were, we didn't want Him. 
So I've learned all of it, and it makes life easier. Now look, I'll be civil to everybody. But, I, but if anybody knows me, they know when they have an in with me or when they don't. They know, I mean, if I, if I let you in, you're in. If I don't, you don't. And, and the reason for all of that is, is simply based upon the danger. You've got to be, pe- be careful with people in your power bar. I have been burnt bad, man, in my lifetime with being open to everybody. I don't do that anymore. Now I'm more prudent. I make decisions. I think things over. I think things through. I trust the bishop in me when I meet souls. And I used to do it as a prophet, but I'm much more expertise and skillful as a bishop. So understanding a prophet that sees a soul is entirely different than a bishop who knows the soul. And now I've incorporated. So I'm, things, God's been good to me. I'm, I'm, Jesus, it says of Christ, He did not give Himself unto man, for He knew what was in the heart of man. He wouldn't trust Him in His power bar. He had to choose Him, but He had to choose the one God chose for Him. If you notice, He never even chose Him. He just received those whom God gave Him. So I learned that one. I just received whom God gave me. I don't try to win anybody. So the same thing, the success of, of a marriage is based on the principles that I've just told you. If your wife doesn't choose you, and there's a wrong motive for her living with you, it's not going to last anyway. If you haven't chosen God as, and your wife because you love her and the premium value that God's put on her, it's not going to last anyway. You're going to have breaches. Breaches causes divorces. If you are in Christ, you can solve the breach before the divorce. And I don't want to hear Crystal, and she never would. She will never devalue me. This is my safety. This is where my, the, her husband, as it says the Proverbs 31 lady, her husband trusts in her explicitly. My heart trusts in my wife that Crystal has never one time devalued me. She doesn't have the ability to emotionally check me off. Now, I can't say the same of my own character, but I can say that of her character. There's something uniquely different about Crystal than any human being I've ever met. I've never been loved like I've been loved. I've never been loved the way she loves me. I've never been cared for the way that she cares for me. I've never experienced a bunch of this stuff. And her whole life, it really truly does center around me and my action and my behavior. She is 100% adaptable to my life and to my soul, my personality. Very unique, very unique to do that. And I haven't seen very few people that can do that. Now, I'm going to say that that doesn't mean she always likes my personality. I find that hard to believe, but you know. But yeah, there's issues about me that I don't like. There's still issues of my unregenerate soul, if you would, that I don't like. How did I get so mad so fast yesterday, day before yesterday? How did that take place in 30 seconds? I don't know. I thought about Lisa. Boy, that didn't take long. You know, so Crystal knows that I could get aggressive in a second. And, uh, and, and if she handles me a certain way, it will take less than a second. So we have, we, we just have, but we, we don't lose value in differing. We don't lose value in, in all of the problems. The moment she'll say, I'm so sorry, oh, well, I don't think about it anymore, it's gone. But I've learned that from her. It used to take me a long time to forgive somebody. Because I punished them. I made sure they were punished. And if they wasn't punished, I'd take longer until they were punished. <laughs> you don't do that anymore. No, I know. That's part of, the, part of my salvation. The, well, the greatest thing in our, in our relationship, I believe, is really communicating to one another. And when we hurt one another, we're quick to communicate. Because I find men will not, but the women are. Like, I don't like to go to bed if I know something's wrong. I want to get this resolved and get it over. To me, it's a little bit different. I know with Randy, he can wear it for a day or two and longer. But with me, I want to get it resolved. But if you can communicate with one another and (coughs) make sure that you repent to one another in humility and in love and keep Satan out, then you will not have those breaches. Because I'm telling you what, if he can cause a breach... There's a, you know, where the scriptures talks about heaping sin upon sin. Well, Satan does the same thing with us in our marriages. He causes one breach and then another and then another and then something else happens. And eventually you you seem to not be able to 
look back and clear it because there's just so much that you've got to get over. But if you keep clearing it with one another, keep communicating with one another, keeping Satan out and preventing those breaches, that's when the marriage can and will be successful. You know what I mean? Because like even when I did something to you and you told me, he expressed, he said, Crystal, you really hurt well, me. What was it you did to me? I don't remember now. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quick to repent to one another. But I, I mean, say you this. do to me, I do to you. And this is what I got from out. you. This is what I got from you was quick to repent. I have never been around any human being that was quicker to forgive than you. And that's a fact. That brought a lot of light on my darkness that I was not quick to repent, excuse me, to forgive. <clears throat> I've been quick to repent to God. But I've never been that quick to forgive. I, I told the truth when I said I grew up punishing people who, pu who punished me. I was on the receiving <coughs> end of it for Only a while. two days, but just two days. <laughs> Jeff knows. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, Jeff took her on a few Northwest Jeff, journeys to I save her. I need to talk to you. <laughs> I need to talk to you. He's punishing me. How many days have you been sleeping in, the, in that back bedroom? Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> Uh, have you had enough yet? No, nope. well, then I'll go another week, bless God. When I see you humble yourself, I'm coming out of the den. But, <laughs> but we, it was true that it would take me, mine was usually two or three days, and I just could not get over it that fast. I couldn't just. And, and see, that's so, when Satan comes in, <clears throat> because that's when you start traveling. Are you saying thoughts. I'm demonic? I'll never say that to you again. <laughs> yeah. I learned my lesson on that one. <laughs> I think, honey, <laughs> I think you have a visitor, and you, it's not somebody that yes, you want to be in yes. fellowship with. So you're saying I'm demonic. Yeah. <laughs> but when you are at a breach and you get angry, you've got to understand that Satan comes in through the thoughts. Yeah. And then you start mm -hmm. having extremely negative, detrimental thoughts towards your mate. And that's when they start uh, devaluing one another. Because if you look at <laughs> any divorce... Uh, you are, like you said, you're divorced way before you divorced. There was yeah. a separation that occurred. And it's not just one event. It's all these little events that are never cleared with one another. And you don't communicate and you pretend that nothing happened and everything's okay. And you are withdrawing your heart from one another. And you both know it, but nobody wants to address the elephant in the room. Well... I kick that elephant out quick, quick, because I don't want the separation. I don't want the breach. I don't want the unforgiveness. I want to be able to go to bed at night and hold your hand. And when you are offended, you are way on that side of the bed. And I kind of scoot over to you, and you'll scoot further away. I'm like, I mean, it's like me getting out, out of the bed and coming back on this side, so I, I just got I'm, room. <laughs> I have never seen what she's talking about. But, I don't get this. <laughs> now, this hasn't happened in, in many, many years. No, so, but we're just talking but, about what we went through. But, yeah, but because... Crystal, seriously, seriously, yours was my standard of forgiveness. I've never experienced that before. And Crystal, you would forgive. This is crazy. This is the truth. I could really breach her in spirit. I could hurt her in soul. And she would make love to me in the next 30 seconds. And it would come from her heart. I couldn't even comprehend that. I couldn't even imagine anybody being able to do that. But she did it over and over and over again because I, I just it was just who she is. But well, I, <clears throat> you know, when you've been forgiven much, you're able to forgive. Well, you forgave a lot because I was very aggressive in the beginning with you. Yeah, but, you know, Randy, um, I'm, not as my life, yeah. I'm not as aggressive as Bobby and Matt, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Jesus. But when you, when you, you know, when I got born again, the Lord really forgave me for so much that I'd done in 31 years. And you but can, Crystal, and you, you can had do this, a lot. this was a part of something that was brought in you from the very day that I knew you. You had a reason to be offended at a number of people, and you didn't do it. You wouldn't carry it. You just didn't do it. And I really it thought... It hurt. Huh? Well, I know it, it hurt. hurt. <laughs> <laughs> the hurt, the pain was there, the pain was but there. you didn't turn that into something destructive. Now, let me take you to my, our last little journey here. This discourse that we're going to have is a, in this area of the breach <clears throat> is that the answer to the solving of the divorce, there's a transitional moment that you recognize there is a breach. You can't linger on that breach. You can't let Satan have give place to the devil for the time that I have done. What I've done in the past, I don't do it anymore. We, 
I mean, we do it right now. We do. Uh, two, day before yesterday, Chris, I'm very sorry. Today she said something, and she said, I'm very sorry. We just don't want that breach being there. And we don't believe we're not going to have it. We believe we're supposed to deal with them. You follow me? You're, you're going to have to face some things about humanity lest you believe in Antichrist. And I don't. I believe I am a human being. Well, then what happens on this is when you recognize it, here's, here is the final javelin of Jesus Christ to this satanic force called divorce. And that is when you clear that matter, what, remember the scripture, what clearing of the matter? And if, listen, this is one of my favorite verses, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So I always say, what if you don't? Do you just assume you're forgiven and cleansed? Yes, but you're theologically wrong. It's if you confess it. So that same principle (coughs) operates right here. (coughs) Excuse me. If I will go and confess Chris, I'm very sorry. I, I want to clear this matter. I don't want to punish anymore. I don't want her to see that I'm right. I'm sorry. What I just said hurt you. No, I was right. Just want to throw that in there. No, I was terribly wrong. Shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have said it. Came out of aggression. Had nothing to do with her. It was anger at a four-wheeler. But it affected her. We immediately, I go in the house and I feel this breach. And she starts. She said, Randy, do you know how when you speak to me how that hurts me like that? Well, I wanted to say to her, I'm sorry it had nothing to do with you, but it was already too late to her. It was personal. So for me to say it had nothing to do with you, I got upset with the four wheeler and took it out on you. That wouldn't have helped either. So I just wanted at that time, you just got to be quiet and let this come and then say I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. If you can clear the matter right then, that's the end of the satanic in that marriage. But let me tell you, if you keep these things, I'm going to take you back to one of my last statements. Many, many years ago, when uh, y'all remember Peggy Stans, she worked in the office. I, to this day, finally figured, it took me a while to figure this out. I walked in the office one day, <clears throat> and she said, uh, I, I guess I'd already done something. Because she looked at us, Randy? Yes, you, you have no idea what it is to be a friend. Well, I thought I was a good friend. I mean, I have a real good friend with me. So I couldn't figure out if, as much as I love me, how could you not? So <laughs> I'm a great friend. <laughs> so I looked and I said, I'm not a good friend? No, you don't know how to be a good friend. Well, I have to be honest with you. I actually believed that. I didn't know what a good friend was then. I thought, well, that could very well be true. I said, uh, can you define that? And she says, yes, all your friends you're mean to. And I said, I didn't know that. And I said, how does that happen? She said, it's your temperament that hasn't been saved. I said, I'm listening. <clears throat> she says, you don't ever clear matters. You retain them. And you keep them. Like, and she said, you're like a volcano. If I've offended you or if I've hurt you or, or somebody in the church, did, you don't say anything to anybody. You just be slowly begin to boil. And then what will happen is the next day you meet Jeff and you just spew. <laughs> just go off. And I saw it. I did it. She said, you did it to me yesterday. I didn't even know I've offended you. I didn't know anything. You've had this for how long? How long have you had this offense with me, but you, you never said anything? Probably about a year. Never said it. No, not till I boil. And that's what I found. That was how I had handled. That's how I handle a certain situation. <clears throat> if someone offends me or bothers me, then I, I do a little quick, emotionally detached from the value of that relationship. And if they continue, then I will boil. If I boil, eventually I would be glad to tell you what's in the pot. <laughs> so that was a truism. Now, the difference was, I could make a lot of offenses and probably have when people left here. Some of you guys are still here that should have left. In other words, you were justified with my offense. You follow me? But you 
It was your temperament that got over it, not my betterment. You were better than me. You were a better man, a better woman than I was, and you forgave and cleared it. And knowing that I still have this, who because I'm, ne I'm never going to uh, live a disguised, hypocritical life. I'm not. If I get mad at Crystal yesterday and holler at it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it out and share. Look, I'm still working with my soul. Christ is still my bishop, still saving me. So I'm not gonna try to hide anything. Try to be some type of. Uh, uh, perfect priest. I'm just not the infallible priest of the Catholic Church. So we go back to humanity, and the answer is, <clears throat> I could I could have cleared that in a day, but I kept it for a year. And so what happens is, your soul through hurts and pains and etc. becomes a warehouse. You follow me? And you keep all these things in, and then you'll start then. It kind of like a firecracker goes off, then one after another, and then there you go. It just you start exploding on people. Well, I, I finally found out from that one scripture about what clearing of the matter. I never would clear it. I just retain it. Mm -hmm. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. They are retained. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned now that retaining offenses in this marriage is going to give Satan a place to give us a breach. And the breach will devalue my marriage, and we will wind up divorced. It's just a cycle. It goes from a breach to no value to divorce. A breach, no value, divorce. But when you have the breach, if you're quick to clear it, you retain the value. You avoid the divorce. Mm -hmm. When Reese and Rhonda took me on the Northwest, as they were listening to me in the car, they knew I had very little value left for Crystal. Didn't even know if I had enough for her that they could help me. They didn't know even if I had enough for her that I could help her. Because I had boiled now for years over certain two or three things that she does all the time. <clears throat> and couldn't get her to stop doing it, so it just keeps igniting that flame. I'm encouraging you all to get that I've gone through all that. I see now that's not the way to do a marriage. So what I've learned now is repent quickly. Don't retain it. Clear it up as fast as you can. And get back in value and premium with one another, and don't have to worry about divorce. Can I share something? Sure, baby. So, <clears throat> you know, when I first married Randy, um, I just thought it was going to be the perfect marriage. <laughs> well, you know, I'm thinking here I'm married to an older man. You know, he's seasoned in the Lord. It's it's going to be great. You know, <laughs> no, seriously. <clears throat> That's how ignorant I was. Now you must. All remember, you got was the older man. I was married before, but I was married out of the will of God. I got married when I was 20, and uh, my husband at the time was committing adultery against me. He was physically abusive, so by the time of 24, I got divorced, and I had an 18-month-old baby. So when I married Randy, I'm thinking we're just going to have this amazing relationship, you know, because he's so much older, and, you know, so I didn't want him to see the areas in my life that I knew were an issue in the sense of this. I knew that I had some areas that God was going to have to deal with. There was no doubt. <clears throat> from my childhood, from you know my relationship with my father, with my brothers, whatever, regardless. Um, <clears throat> when you are not born again, when you're not raised in the knowledge and the ammunition of the Lord, Satan's going to raise you. And he's going to put these things in you that are going to <clears throat> cause you uh, to have dysfunctional relationships until Christ is able to touch those areas of your life. And I remember the first time that we had a situation, an argument, a disagreement, whatever it was, and I was so shocked because I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, um, you know, Randy's lost his value for me now. This marriage is not as great as I thought it was going to be because now all of these issues are coming out because, yes, I'm a baby in Christ. I was born six, uh, I was born again for six months. Um, I have n had not been discipled, but the six months that I've been in South Africa, and here I'm marrying a, mat a mature parterre. I'm marrying an apostolic man, a governmental man. What was wrong with me? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, anyway, I realized and I had to learn, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's going through the trials and the arguments and the fussing and the fighting in that marriage that brings that marriage to great maturity, um, love, 
and endurance. It's those marriages that are able to get through that and work through that that builds the great marriage that we all want. It's not trying to live the fantasy of what we think is real. What you have in the kingdom is what is real. You're going to have trials. You're going to have disagreements. You're going to have fussing and breaches. But it's working <coughs> through all of that as a couple that brings that marriage to such glory and honor for God and in the house of the Lord because you've gone through things. And I realized it's not avoiding those situations. And that's what I was looking at. I was trying to avoid and be the perfect wife and handle everything right. And my soul would not permit that. It just would not permit that. I would say things when I shouldn't have said things. I handled <coughs> Randy wrong. Um, I was argumentative. I was gainsaying. I was contentious. I mean, you, you could, I've got the list. I mean, everything that I, I should not have list. been, everything that I should not have been is exactly what I was. But in all of that, God was showing me the woman that I was to become yeah. and the marriage that we <coughs> were to have. Mm -hmm. But it's not avoiding the situations. And the truth is we avoid the situations too often. Yeah. And when we should just clear them. We need to clear Confess them. Confess them and clear them. Absolutely, because in the confessing of that situation and in the clearing is where you are actually knitted closer together and your marriage is strengthened. And so I want to encourage you that don't ignore them. Work through them. I've thought about, you know, the, the younger married couples like Chad and his wife and some of the others here. You've, you're going to get those situations. Don't devalue one another because the situation is not there to devalue, but it's to get you through, to bring you to more value, more premium, and greater glory in Christ, and to stabilize that marriage with maturity. <clears throat> Patty, you want to come on up? It's interesting. The last phase of this teaching, I'm not going to take the time tonight, uh, this is the little title called The Repairer of the Breach. And uh, Christ is that man. He's the man who walks between the pieces, is he not? And I was going to bring that out, <clears throat> and then right before I came up here tonight and began to speak, Patty says to me, Randy, I have a song tonight called The Repair of the Breach. And I just thought, that, well, so I thought it was apropos. <clears throat> so she's going to sing a, a song called The Repair of the Breach. And uh, Patty? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have you practiced this? <laughs> just a little. Sorry, sorry, Ralph. <laughs> 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 Ooh. Oh. Okay.
Thank you, Patty. He is the repair of the breach, is he not? Yes. <clears throat> so I end with this by saying, you take our counsel tonight. You take the years of our lives together. And we've combined all that with mine and Gloria and her marriage to the past and who we are now. <clears throat> we have great counsel for you all from showbread. You can solve a lot of your problems in your future. <clears throat> There'll never be another divorce in this house if we just do this one night tonight. Our lives and our marriage will be, and I'll take you back to the scripture. The error of thinking <clears throat> through religion is this. You don't find the mystery of Jesus Christ in the church. The mystery of Jesus Christ is a husband and a wife. And the church thinks they can find it by all their theology and doctrines and ordinations of pastors and all that. Somehow it reveals the mystery of Christ. It doesn't. He says, I speak concerning Christ in the church. But what was that mystery? It's the husband and wife. If you really want to know the mystery of Jesus Christ or the church, you don't look at the church, you look at marriages. That's where the mystery is. <clears throat> right here you're looking at what Christ has taught us on principles of success fame and glory in a marriage. How you can be highly successful in a marriage. How you can go far beyond what you've dreamed you could. Never dreamed I could have a union like this in spirit. Never thought about a, a soul tie if you were so blend. I never saw that was even available or possible. The journey I've been on with the Lord has been remarkable. I'm grateful for it. <clears throat> Everything we go through, it doesn't matter what it is, it's an education of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Even in this, what I'm going through, what, what uh, Bobby's going through, at least going, it's a conformity to Jesus Christ. It's altering your thinking. It's changing your paradigms to adapting you to the conformity of Christ. Every marriage, every conflict changes you, alters you, conforms you better to the image of Jesus Christ and His likeness in that marriage. Every negative thing that comes your way, He's transferring it through a positive concept of conformity to Christ. You can go negative with it, and it'll destroy you. Or you can look at it at a conformity to Christ and come out with glory of God. So I look at my marriage. I'm grateful to it, <clears throat> to the Lord. <clears throat> and by the way, again, it has. This is going to be <clears throat> sound a little strange to you, but it has nothing to do with the truck. It has nothing to do with the four wheeler. It has nothing to do with crystal. It has to do with the giver, not the gifts. 
I'm grateful for the gifts, but those gifts have no value to me and that it didn't come from the giver. Because I've had choices I have made and they had no value to me. You've heard of the one night stands. I've experienced those. No value. Because you chose it. But everything that I have in my life now has the highest level of premium because when I was in South Africa, he says, I have something here for you and I have something here for me. That's value to me. That statement is value. <clears throat> and then he says, can a man love again? Can a man live again? I never thought about that. I didn't know that I was already finished. I, at the death of Gloria, I had resigned to a lot of things. Didn't know it. <clears throat> If anybody's paying attention, I just gave you two country songs. <laughs> Come and give. We'll see you tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff, for this idea of this lapel. Uh, that was a great idea to keep that uh, hand held. Are, are we off? Are we still alive? I am. That's what I'm depending on. 